No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today, I'm extremely excited to be doing an interview with possibly my favorite YouTuber at this time, somebody I've been fascinated by ever since I found out about him. I really believe one of the, the best voices coming up out of this sort of prison YouTube world, but has definitely become something a lot bigger than that. Today, we're sitting down with the one and only 1090 Jake. So, my guy, how you doing? I'm doing, man, I'm doing good, bro. I appreciate you bringing me out here. No doubt, man. This is a conversation I wanted to have ever since I found out about you because I feel like you're somebody where you, you came up super fast because people just see you, they realize you're the real deal, and there's just like a huge amount of fascination around what you got going on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, one thing that I haven't really seen you discuss that much that I'm really interested in is can we talk about uh, your your very early life, like like all about growing up and everything? You're from Massachusetts originally. Yeah, I grew up I grew up in Massachusetts. I was born in Malden, mm. which is like right outside of Boston. It's like five train stops away. You ever been to Nashua? I've never been to Nashua. That's I lived right. in New Hampshire for a year. Where at? Or not even a year. I think it was a month. I don't remember because I was so young. Oh, I was okay. like two. We moved there, and then our house got robbed right after Christmas, and we got the fuck out. Yeah. yeah so, New Hampshire's good for that, yeah? Yeah, I had no idea about nothing. I thought it was just snowboarding and all that, but <laughs> I found out I actually lived there, and uh, it didn't go too good. Right. But for me, I grew up all over the place. You know, my parents, uh, they separated before I was born. Right. So I grew up really, it was two different households and I can't say it was like a, a bad a bad home, but it was hostile at times because whichever parent I'm with is talking about the other one. Uh. So it's a lot of situations, like if I'm getting dropped off in the weekend at this house, I gotta go get the child support check and you know, they're not even trying to see each other. So right. it was kind of a hostile environment. It wasn't a bad home as far as like poverty and all that, but it wasn't a happy home either. Yeah, were your parents sort of in the streets or outside like that at all? I never knew anything about any of that until I grew up. Mm. So like my mother, nah, not at all. And my mother, when I was real young, I'd be going and living with my aunt. So I lived with her a lot. That's who I ended up moving in with when I went down to Florida. Um, mm. I lived with her because my mom was just doing her thing. She was still young. She was young when she had me. And uh, my father, I always had a gangster impression of him. Mm. So I'm Italian and Irish. So the whole family big on like all the mob shit, you know what I mean? Right. And I'm always looking at him like, oh, he must be in something. He must be in something. Cause just the way he move, he's got a friend on every block we go to. People always pulling up. I'm just thinking he got a lot of friends when I'm little. Years down the line, I found out he was selling drugs the whole time. Uh. So I had no idea about none of that. You know what I mean? But so, so you never really saw like the the impact of nah, that. I never I never saw anything crazy. I just thought he had a lot of friends. I never seen. They never exposed me to nothing. So I can't complain and say like, oh, as a kid I was seeing this and that. I wasn't. You know what I mean? Everything right. was. But I found out later on. Like at one point in time, because when I. Like, I didn't have a bed, bro, until I was, like, eight years old. I was, was on couches, futons, floors, shit like that. Wow. So my people would stay with other people. So my father would stay in the basement. We on a pull-out couch, whatever it is. We had a hallway you would go through to get to the bathroom, and that's where the washer and dryer was. I think I had toys in there, some shit, and I found a, a gun. You know what I mean? So he caught me when I found it. He trying to tell me it's a BB gun, but he won't let me. Like, he took it away, put it up, you know, whatever, whatever. And then I found out what that was. So just as I got older, you know. Definitely. Did did it occur to you as a kid? Like, oh, I'm coming up from, like, a very rough background? Because I feel like there's there's got to be a moment where it sort of starts to click for you and you realize that your upbringing might be different from other kids. Nah, it, it, it didn't click until I went to school mm. because I've, I've been to a bunch of different schools. I lived in a bunch of different neighborhoods. So one thing about me, I don't claim a specific neighborhood because I've always moved. I've always switched schools. So at one point I went to one school. It was one black kid in the whole school. It was an all white school. Right. But me, I don't have the money. So I'm not dressing the same way. I'm not looking the same way. So I'm standing out. I'm not acting the same way. That's when I started noticing differences or like, trying to have someone come over my house to hang out and they view my house, they looking kind of crazy. Mm. And then their parents don't want me to hang out with their kid, little shit like that. Right. And then once I moved with my father, got back into the city, I fit right in. Right, definitely. So were you getting in trouble in school and stuff? Cause did you have that yeah, anger that sort of pushed you in that direction? Nah, I was a class clown. Mm. Yeah, I was just, I didn't do shit. Uh, it got to a point where teachers wouldn't even give me no uh, schoolwork. I just, 
I like to hang out. I liked it because it was fun, but right. as far as getting in trouble, nah, I got suspended a shitload of times. It really got worse, like middle school, high school. Right. High school, freshman year, they had me under investigation for selling ecstasy, guns in the school. So we had a whole little situation going on. So, I mean, you're in elementary school and presumably you're not really uh, selling any illegal stuff. At what nah, point, at what point does that kind of kick in? I wasn't on shit till middle school. Okay. Really? The year before I moved down to Florida. Right. So I was with my father for one year. I moved in with him. Whatever, whatever. He went his way. He kind of turned on me. So you left Boston, the Boston area at what age? I moved down to Florida when I was 13. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a totally different environment or? Yeah. I moved down to Florida within like two months. I had my first gun down there. Really? Yeah, it was easy. And you hadn't been thinking about getting a gun when you were in Mass? Fuck no, but I came down here and everybody got everything. <laughs> right. It's a whole nother world, it's a different culture. And like for me, bro, I didn't have shit in common with people. Like I didn't like sports. I didn't like this, I didn't like that. So for me, I was attracted to the madness. Right. So everywhere I went, I sought out people that was into the shit that I'm into. Right. You could have put me in any environment, I would have found the worst people there. Cause that's the type of shit I was doing. And that's what I would connect with people on. Oh, you want to fight? Oh, you want to do this? You that? All right, I like you. You know what I mean? So when I went to Florida, that's what I was seeking out. And at the time, when I moved down there, I was angry. Cause you know, there was a lot of shit with my parents, abuse and shit that I really don't get into. Cause mm -hmm. I'm not really on good terms with them right now, right. even to this day. Um, but by the time I moved down there, I was an insecure, angry 13 year old kid that wanted to hurt people to feel better about me, you right. know what I mean? And I kind of like lashed out. And when I first moved, I moved in with my grandmother who couldn't control me. Mm. Even less of a chance of her controlling you than your parents. But she couldn't do shit. I wasn't going to school or nothing. Right, where, yeah. where in Florida did you move again? Uh, <clears throat> when I first moved down, I was in the Port Charlotte, Northport area, which is like more South <clears throat> Florida, but I was back and forth in Tampa. Right. So my aunt was in Tampa. I couldn't move in with her immediately. I was with my grandmother for a year and causing all hell. Then I moved to Tampa. Right. Do you even know about gang shit when you first moved to Florida? Yeah, fuck yeah. Okay. You already yeah. knew about that. I already knew that up in Boston. So that's really where I had like my first impression on gangs is when I was younger, there was somebody older than me. He was probably like 15, but being young as fuck, I'm looking at him like, oh, that's the big bro. Right. And he was blood. You know what I mean? So he telling me, like, we riding out, hanging out, and he's like, oh, yeah, you you that. So from that early age, I'm screaming on that, even though I'm, I'm really not. Right. You know what I mean? And then I go to Florida, I'm still in the same shit, but the gang shit down there, that's what was more official and in your face. You how, how established was the gang shit in Boston, though, at that time? It's not at all. It doesn't seem like it would have been much. It, it, I, isn't, it isn't even to this day. So Boston okay. ain't really on no hood. It's, it's all hoods. Right. It's not really gangs. You're going to have, you might have certain gang members within certain hoods. You know what I mean? Because you even got, like, out here, the, uh, the Stones, BPS or whatever, they in Boston. Okay. You know what I mean? And that's all West Side. So. But there's not a lot of examples of that, of gangs that are out here that also exist in Boston? Nah. Outside of Massachusetts, uh, outside of Massachusetts they got Asian boys. They got uh, Tiny Rascals. A lot of the Cambodian gangs that started out here, they, mi they migrated a mass. Right. Uh, they got GDs from Chicago, all type of shit. But it's not in the city of Boston. Boston is strictly hoods and streets right so like for me when i moved out the street i was living on just that one street had multiple different hoods every single you know you got one corner store for you the next corner store is someone else's shit it's crazy because i lived in lowell for a year uh going to umass lowell when i was 19 and when i think back on that time period nobody was talking about like black gangs or like oh you got to be scared of this dude or whatever it was the cambodians that people were scared of like if you Tearing were at the skate up. park the person who was going to rob you at the skate park or whatever was a cambodian dude for sure yeah. which is kind of strange to me at, at the time because now people act like when i did that stupid young vlog people are shocked i'm nah, like be, i was kind of used to that they be getting it in yeah they demand respect and they'll fuck some shit up so Big time. they do their thing okay but so how do you kind of find your groove in florida well, like I said, I was attracted to the madness. So by the time I hit Tampa, just seeking out the people I was seeking out, I got into the crowd, you know what I'm saying? So on a game tip, it wasn't like I had applications and was like, <laughs> oh, you can be a crib, you can be a this. You, everybody around me was blood. Tampa's a blood city. Mm. We got other shit, but Tampa, 
you know, it's blood. That's what it is. It's a red city. Right. So I got around the homies and shit. I've already been claiming this shit anyways, and I wasn't even officially, you know what I mean? And then I got put on. Right. How was that? I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> you got to go through it. Yeah, but there's levels to that shit. Would you, would you say it was a 10 or is it a, was it a light one? No, nah, mine was wild. It's, I'm white. Mm. So it's different. A lot of people like, oh, you don't, ain't no white bloods, ain't no this, ain't no that. They really ain't. Right. So at this point in time, not to sound no type of way, but I'm about the biggest known white blood that there is. It's not common like that. It's not. So for me, I had to show out. Right. You know what I mean? But at the same time, yeah, I got my ass whooped. When you think about it in retrospect, do you feel like you always felt like you had to go harder because you were white or, or yeah. you had to really sort of overcompensate because you didn't want anybody trying to press you? Yeah, I mean, it ain't even, you gonna get pressed. Like, it's, that's what comes with the territory. But everybody you meet, you gonna have the same reaction, bro. And it's just like, even when I jumped on YouTube, the majority of the people that's talking shit, they're not in nothing. Mm. It's random fat white guys that sit at home, 30s, 40s, 50s, and talk mad shit. I don't know why, but the sober community hates me. All the ex-drug <laughs> addicts and shit, they're like, oh, you ain't on nothing. I was on the head. And like, bro, worry about the sobriety. Don't worry about me. But it's like a lot of people will just look at it like, oh, white this? Nah, he ain't on that. Yeah. But then they talk to somebody. So there was a situation when I was in prison. A homie came through. The homies are telling him who I am. And he's like, oh, ain't no white down moves. Like, oh, yeah? Go tell him. He said, what you mean? Nah, go tell him that. Right. He didn't want to tell me. So, you know, that in itself, it it speaks for itself. You know what I mean? And it puts you in kind of a weird position where it's like you have to sort of express yourself way more aggressively just to defend the shit that you are saying That's that you are. You know? I'm not even like, bro, I'm I'm to myself. Mm. I'm quiet. You know what I mean? Now. So Yeah. Well, even then, bro, <laughs> like I wasn't I wasn't really like a loud mouth type of. Like, just get loud and seem aggressive. Nah, it was just when it came down to doing things, I did things. Right. And the things that I did, the, the word traveled on it. Definitely. So it kind of built its own reputation. Yeah, that's one thing I got from watching some of your older interviews. It's like, oh, Jake learned at a very young age that he had to just not wait for somebody else to be aggressive to him. He had to be ready to just go for it. No, nah, yeah. I not started, let them started, get the drop. I started just smacking shit, especially when I went to prison. Right. You just got to do what you got to do. And you were doing youth offender shit or whatever, so you were getting locked up throughout your... Nah, so the youth offender thing be confusing a lot of people. So I went through juvie. I did the juvie thing, uh, but I went to prison when I turned 18. Okay. So in Florida, we have youth offender prisons. So people will be like, oh, that sounds like kid shit, da-da-da. The youth offenders in, in the Florida Department of Corrections is the most fucking violent prisons you're going to be in. Right. So this is state prison. We're going to state prison. This isn't, we got our own section now. We go to the same reception as the adults. We're on the same transfer buses as the adults. Youth offender is 14 to 24 years old. Mm -hmm. So they put us in our own dorms and we tear it down. It's just nonstop violence. So when I got sent to prison, I wasn't sentenced as a YO, but I was reclassified as a YO. So I ended up having to go to the YO dorms and it's just, it's on site, nonstop violence. It's gangland, and the second you get in there, if you've never seen violence before, right. it's a culture shock because you're seeing it on a level that it's fucking insane. What, what were you seeing at first that really just blew your mind in terms of what went on in here? Uh, what, when I went to prison? Yeah. Oh, when we had to strip naked. Okay. Yeah, we had to get off that bus <laughs> early as fuck in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a dude in a wheelchair who had no legs. They told him to get naked too. They told him to strip the fuck down. Oh yeah, and, and, uh, he's looking at him like, what the fuck, yeah. And uh, there was a CEO in Orlando, I don't know if he still works there, but his name's Six Six, big black dude. And uh, he's supposedly a crip, the CEO. So there's certain CEOs that are known at certain spots for fucking inmates up, smacking the shit out of you, whatever. So he walked up to a Mexican that was standing there minding his business. And mind, we all dick out and everything, just standing up looking straight ahead. <clears throat> so um, he had his property or whatever, he dumped his shit on the ground, whatever, whatever. But he ended up saying some <laughs> racist ass shit and I didn't expect it to come from him being that he was a black CEO. Mm. You know what I mean? So he's asking him, oh, what's in your property, da da da, you got a towel? He said, no sir. He said, why don't you bring your towel? He's like, confused. He said, how are you gonna get all that wet off your back? <laughs> and we just sitting there like, damn. 
Like they're not sparing nobody. Like right. they're getting on. It's not even when you get the the certain spots with the white COs. It's like real Ku Klux Klan, like raccoons hanging off of nooses. That's their keychain. Shit's different. Because it, it occurs to me that like if you had a clean bill of health, if mentally you you were all there, that you would not put yourself into this environment and want to work in this shit. Or do you feel like once you're in there, it drives people? crazy and makes them kind of start to imitate the the prisoners that they're around almost it's like uh you ever seen like texas chainsaw the movie bit. so it's like the whole town was in it they were all the killers so in certain parts of florida they got these little raggedy ass towns the whole fucking family works in the prison right the nurse is the wife the fucking warden is the uncle so you hit a co you liable to get sent to somewhere where there's nothing but their family and they're going to take care of all that. So it's like their communities really function off the prisons. They thrive off the prisons. That's like the main job. If you live in that little country ass area, right. the main job for you there, the best <coughs> career opportunity is working in the prison. And it's just once they in there, they taste that power. Mm. Because, bro, the COs are slapping the fuck out of everybody. Right. Adults, youth defenders. It's worse for us. The youth defenders, we get mm -hmm. fucked up. Like, we get punched on our shit. They're not teeth out. But there's certain spots, like Lake Butler was known for having a job with gold teeth. So if you came mm -hmm. through from Miami, from Orlando, because Lake Butler is known for the KKK. You can look this shit up even now. Like, recently, wow. KKK getting locked up, undercover stings inside of the prisons. They were killing people and burying people at the prison and building buildings over their bodies. They put you on a permanent transfer list. So when you call to find out, hey, where's so-and-so at? I'm looking him up. I can't find him. He's not writing me back. Oh, he's in transfer. We can't tell you where he's at. But he's dead. Been dead as fuck. And how, how are they years. able to pull that off for 10 years? Because for real? the whole Florida Department of Corrections is corrupt from every single level up, from the CEOs to the wardens to the inspectors to the fucking. Wow. Yeah, they, they fuck. It, you're more likely to die from a CEO than an inmate. Wow. It ain't like out here where everybody's just getting stabbed to death. No, they'll beat the fuck out of you, kill you, and then put it on an inmate. Because, like, I've seen cops get violent with people. It was usually in response to the person, you know, wilding out or, like, flipping out on the cop or, or even hitting the cop or whatever. But, like, even just showing up at prison and just seeing a fucking cop just deck a person in the face would blow my fucking mind. Like, oh, we're really in a very different place right yeah, now. Yeah, how, how you think I felt when I got the shit slapped out of me? I didn't know how. <laughs> how long did it take before that happened? Uh, I mean, when I first, I didn't get hit by a CO until I, I got to my first prison. The reception center, it wasn't on nothing. So one of the COs there was a king. He was fucking with us heavy, so he was giving us, like, K2, weed, tobacco. We smoking. We really, like, ran that shit. But um, first time a CO fucked with me was when I hit something CI. So something, they ran it like a boot camp. So we had a sergeant named Sergeant A.B. He got the fucking military hat on and everything. And the COs are giving us warnings. Like when I hit, when I hit reception, let me rewind a bit. When I hit reception, <clears throat> before I walked into the dorm, right, CO comes up to me. I'm the only white kid. So he's like, hey, listen. So white CO, hey, listen. They're going to try you in there. Do what you got to do. I'm not telling you to do nothing crazy, but do what you got to do. I'm just thinking to myself, why the fuck is he telling me this? Is it that bad? You warning me right now? Like, I don't know if he's just on some white guy, white guy shit, but I looked in the window and ain't nothing but black faces looking back at me. Mm. Ain't no other white people in there. So I'm like, oh, fuck. So I get in there. Hey, come to the table. First quarter, like everybody rushed the table though. Who you is? Where you from? What you is? Blah, blah, blah. And then I knew somebody that was in there and we kind of cleared the whole situation. The first prison though, they open up the bus. Sergeant AB comes up. He peeks his head in. Hey, y'all can hear me? Yes, sir. He's whispering. We like, what the fuck? He said, I'm gonna give y'all the five to get the fuck off this bus. You understand? Yes, sir. Five, four, three, two. We gotta jump off. So it's straight like military action. They slamming us against the fences, picking us up, slamming us on the floor. They take us into this room. They tell us to run into this dark ass room. Right. Can't see nothing in there. I'm the first one lined up. They tell me go. I said fuck no. Told the kid next to me. I was taking his food at reception. I tell him to go in there. So he runs off in there, right? He runs off, the CO stops. Nah, I told you to do it. So I run off in there. The second I run up in there, I get picked up, slammed on my shit. Boots is kicking me in the face immediately. And this is a whole 
system that they've designed to basically demoralize you and make it so that you're less likely to act out they, they want you to understand who runs that shit right so they beat the fuck out of every single one of us one by one got us all in the same room and then made us line up dick the butt wow so it's, they tell you dick the butt like you got to put your dick up on his butt and y'all like this in line and they come through to walk up chin checking shit like fucking us up one of the, there was a female she had a broomstick she's poking inmates in the ass with it saying we're gonna get fucked when we hit the compound so that's something that was happening a lot was kids was getting TOHs and they getting fucked with broomsticks and shit that's blowing their guts out. Jesus. So they trying to they trying to extort you type shit. So the extortion at Sumter really throughout the YOs it's at an all time high. So a TOH is a test of high. Right. That's how they're gonna test you. So like if you a Chico, if you any type of Hispanic, they're gonna do it to you. If you're black, whatever gang you're in, they're going to do it to you. If you're white, anybody's going to do it to you. So the rough definition of that is basically it's like, because you gave one example in an older interview I saw where you were saying that you pulled up, you're a blood, and then you had like a bunch of dudes run up on you. Basically, they were bloods, but they were saying they were crips trying to press you. Or I don't know if this actually happened to you or you were just giving an example. No, I think I was giving an example. We used to do that shit to people. So, you know, if there was a crip or a blood or whatever, we would act like we the opposite shit to see what they're talking about. Right. We, I mean, we saying the most disrespectful things we can come up with. Right. You know what I mean? Because we used to smash shit. So it's like, we would get someone that was really in the gang and flip them and have them write out all their little lingo, knowledge, whatever. So when one of them come, we can check them. Mm. So we checking you on your crip shit to find out if you know what the fuck you is. And if you don't know, it's easy to finesse you. Right. And then, you know, if we can finesse it without <clears> violence, <throat> we're getting that food off of you. But if we got to apply pressure, we apply pressure. So, yeah, we don't want you to feel comfortable. It's not like, you know, now that I've gotten into YouTube and I hear how other politics are, it's not like out West where your homies are going to embrace you, get you right on the food, check your paperwork. Nah, we're not on none of that. We're going to find out how the fuck you're going to stand if you're in a dorm by yourself. Right. Because if you get put into a dorm by yourself and they're like, oh, ain't no bloods in here, you're like, okay, you folded. You just folded, you know what I mean? Right. So we're going to do that first, and then if you fuck up, we're going to get you. Wow. That's crazy. So if you show up in prison and you already have, like, a street rep, could you be embraced automatically? Yeah, Is fuck it, yeah. Basically, if you are random, if you, if you, you got to figure if, out what's going on. If you on. run into the right people, or if you got somebody you know that's in the dorm with you, you're good, but it could really be dorm to dorm because you might get put in the wrong dorm. But so this first one you got put in is all black dudes, so it's like, it's not like No, this. there was white kids in there, but oh, they were sitting on the floor. You couldn't see them. Really? Yeah, they couldn't sit on the benches. So that's just straight bitch so status right there. So when the CEO right saw me sitting on the bench, that's when they knew, like, oh, this is somebody. Who the fuck is this? They called me in the booth. They trying to G-chat me. One of the CEOs was talking about he a blood. Really? The CEOs, bro, like the CEOs gangbang type shit. So it's like, if you meet one that's that, you might start getting hooked up. And we did start getting hooked up. Wow. But we were really getting hooked up off the king. The King CEO. Okay. He started bringing Why, why that was shit. he fucking with you guys so much? Well, the house man that ran the little unit that I was in was a Latin king. Mm. So just off the strength, they both kings, he started supplying shit. And at the same time, we kept shit in order because we was the most violent one. We were 18 and under. Right. So you had 18 and under. This is, this is at the Central Florida Reception Center. It's H-Dorm. Hell Dorm, Hotel Dorm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's three different wings to it. So one is 18 and under, the other one's 19 to 20, and then 21 to 24. 21 to 24 look like old men. Mm. They sit in there drinking coffee, they're not on nothing. They're not in their business. Through it. And there's already like four or five of them in there. Like there's no one in there. 19 to 20, that's a little decent. A couple of them got scars on their faces because they already went to a prison and they're switching prisons. 18 and under, we're the most vicious because we're trying to make a name. Right. So he, the, the king CEO, <clears throat> the King CEO used to basically let us run the house. So it's like, if somebody wants to fight, he would open the mop <clears throat> closet, we get in there, we handle that. He just didn't want us cutting anybody. Mm. As long as no one's getting cut, nobody's getting poked up, we can handle it how we handle it. And I became a house man. So when new cocks used to come in, we get to pop their cell like we're cleaning it, and we're running down on them, beating them with broomsticks, <laughs> and getting whatever the fuck we can get, because we're all starving at this point. Like, I don't want to sound like I'm a fucking, 
you know, but we're hungry. Right. None of us have food. Nobody ever sent me food when I was in prison. I got food like two times. So if you don't have money coming in from a family member or whatever, Stop, it's bro. just not enough food. So everybody's no. kind of in this constant state yeah, you, of you, scarcity. You, you can't even eat everything that's on the tray. It's not all edible. And then at the same time, like the milk be spoiled as fuck. Really? So it's really on some shit. Like if you're not finna fight about that food, just give it up. Now that you've talked to like a million different people who are in different prisons all over America, does it stand out to you that Florida might actually be the worst? I don't think Florida is the worst. I would say probably out here. Really? Yeah, because I don't want to wake up and work out every fucking day. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could be lazy in Florida, but the thing about it is the politics out here is respectable. Right. It cleans a lot of shit up and it keeps shit organized. Right. You know, so California got the SNY shit, the PC shit, and that's where all the madness is at as far as like sex offenders, the weirdos, the snitches. Florida, we're all in one spot. There's no separation. There's no PC in Florida. Bro, PC is a confinement status. Right. You just go to the box. Like, if you checked in on me, bro, and you went PC, I could go PC, or he could go PC, and then he gonna get put in the cell with you, and then what's gonna happen is I'm gonna take an envelope, I'm gonna write it out in his name, but I'm not gonna put, like, it's gonna miss the zip code or something. So what happens is the letter goes to the mail room, and then they send it back to him, who's in the cell with you. You don't even know that he knows me, though. But what I already did is I took a razor blade, broke it in half, put it behind the stamp. So when the letter comes back to him, now we got a razor, now he's cutting you up in the cell. You can't get out. So you can go PC, but we're going to get at you. There's no separate compound for you. Jesus Christ. Yeah, you're just going to get sent to another prison. So were you having fun doing all this when you first got in there? Because this is kind of like, yes, you know, you're 100%. someone who's attracted to madness. Once you get into this environment, I mean, this is like oh, was, the was, most madness myself, you can like, imagine. Bro, this is it. Like, it isn't, the only step on the prison is death. Right. It doesn't get worse than that. You prison and you die. You know what I mean? So when I was in there, you can't do nothing but love it, bro. You can't just sit there and be fucking depressed. Like, this is the next three years of my life. I'm 18 years old. We got to turn up. And I mean, there's a lot of good times. Not everything is violent. You know, right. you, you meet a lot of solid people, but the most solid people I met were at the most violent places because that's what people's true colors show. When you meet somebody that you know was willing to shed blood about you, whether it's their own or fucking someone else up, right. it's a different kind of vibe. You know, we got one soup. We're splitting it two ways. Like, there's a lot of good times, but it's a lot of fucked up shit. And the thing about it, mentally... Is in there, you're just consumed by madness. Mm. You don't know or you don't understand how it's gonna hit you until you get out. I didn't. I was fine in there. You know what I mean? Like, my first year, I got cut, I got poked up, I got hit with a brick. My first prison, I cut a kid in the cell with me. So I, I dove into it head first. Mm. I got into I was getting hit up, I was hitting shit up. When I got out and was in a peaceful environment, I'll be sitting with my daughter. That's when shit starts coming back to me and it starts right. fucking me up. But I never had an issue when I was in there. Does it fuck you up just thinking about like this lifestyle you have now where it's like you're so able to remove yourself from any, any kind of risk? And like, it's, it's gotta be strange to think like I'm the same person, but I was in that environment doing this shit. And, and now and I'm chilling in my house making videos all day or whatever. I mean, it's crazy when I think about it, but I don't feel like I ever left it because mm. I still like struggle with a lot of that shit mentally. I just don't really talk about it. So a big part of me changing my content from me going to the prison shit, not only was the prison community getting played out with just everybody's doing it, you <laughs> yeah. can only hear the same shit so many times. Like, I feel like I got in at the right time and got the fuck out. But another major aspect of that was all the dreams started coming back to me. Really? So it's like... From just dwelling on it and talking about that shit so much? Yeah, so, you know... When you're, when you're a kid, when you're whatever, before you've ever had sex, you've dreamed about getting some. Yeah. You know what I mean? But before you actually get it, you wake up. Because you, your mind can't process something you've never experienced. If you fall in your dream, before you die, you wake up. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. I never dreamed about super violent shit until I started doing it. Mm. And uh, that's what started fucking me up, bro, is when I started telling these stories... I would have these dreams where either I'm hitting someone up or they're hitting me up. Like I'm just sitting down getting stabbed repeatedly or I'm watching it happen and I can't stop looking. I have to watch it. And the thing about when you experience shit like that, it ain't what I'm seeing that fucks with me. I remember the smells that came with it. Mm. The smell of the blood, the sounds of the person gurgling on their shit. 
You know, it's shit like that that fucks me up. And then I wake up and I'm like breathing heavy and like, damn, you know, like that's now is when these things come back to me. So that's that was the main reason why I really wanted to get off that shit and try to find another avenue because I have to relive it when I tell it. See, that's interesting because I feel like a lot of guys get into street shit or whatever, in part because they want to sort of prove that they're able to do all this shit and that it won't be that big a deal to them yeah. but it's interesting to see you at the point you can actually be honest and acknowledge that like yeah slicing somebody's sh- shit open as tough as you might be or as much as you might have felt like you had to do that in that moment i mean th- there's going to be a, a memory of that that's going to linger in your brain and realistically when you when your head is clear when you're having a nice time it might just reappear you know yeah every sky you put on a person mentally skies you mm. And I didn't understand that until now. So, you know, at the time, like the first kid that I cut, I told that in the first interview that I did, I slit his whole shit. I hit him three times on his throat. I had no idea how the fuck it was going to be. I didn't know if it was going to start shooting out and shit. None of that happened. But once I did that shit and then moved him out of the cell, I'm celebrating on the door. Right. All my homies are celebrating. Like, yeah, he just got one. And then when I got popped, I got popped at the next spot I went to. Right. I get hit. I'm sitting in the cell for three days with blood-soaked fucking... Uniform on, like they didn't give me a new uniform or nothing. They stitched you up or not? Nah, they glued my face shut with a hot glue gun. Right. So the kid that cut me, he and did it. Why did he do that? The kid that cut me? Yeah. Uh, well, at the first prison we went to, he was supposed to be a blood. We're at the reception center. Right. And he was in the cell with a Mexican that was supposed to be a 13. So out of nowhere, the 13 folds his flag, and the next day we wake up and we get sent to the prison. Somehow he's a blood. So I'm like, you just made him a blood overnight out of nowhere? How the fuck that worked? So, you know, when we hit the dorm, I was like, hey, bro, both of y'all folded. Neither one of y'all nothing. Like, fuck y'all. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, the Zoes, who we were into it with, they came up to me and they were like, why would you fold your only two brothers that's in here? Because now it's just us versus you. And I told him I'd rather be one strong than 500 weak. Fuck them. If I can fold them, you could fold them. Mm-hmm. But you ain't finna fold me. Right. You might hit me up, but I'm going to tear one of y'all ass up too. You know, so I folded him at that spot. When I went to Lake Butler, he was already there because he hit the compound. A crip hit him in the brick, well, in the face with a brick and broke his nose. So he was at Butler not for transfer, but for medical. So he had a nose cast and everything. So when I get the Butler, the GDs and I block come up to me. They're like, oh, what you is? Oh, I'm blood. Oh, we tied flags. I'm no the fuck we not. Why the fuck are we tied flags? You know, people are just like random gangs will click up on some whatever shit. I wasn't on that though. Right. So they like, oh, you got a brother in here. They point to him. He comes out of his cell. So you are, you are anti-peace. You are like, nah. nah y'all y'all just, are getting along. I don't just, want anything to do just, with that. It's just shit that makes sense. Like, why the right. fuck are we tied flags? Right. For what? Who who sanctioned? Like, who? for what reason? You want to know the details of yeah, how this bro, I don't. I told them I don't want to talk to the soldiers. I want to talk to the heads, bro. Right. Y'all could have just started gang banging. Why the fuck am I talking to you? I'm turf made. I went to prison banging. Y'all just started doing this shit. So you don't even know nothing. You just learn how to shake up and this, that, and that. I'm not even trying to talk to y'all. Y'all just started this shit. I've been doing it. So I see him come out. I'm like, he ain't nothing. I just folded him at the last spot. Mm. Where it spreads to the blood on the other side of eye block that I don't got contact with. Right. He's supposed to be running the situation. He fucks with dude. And he didn't know the story. So when I'm in the cell, the head homie comes over. He comes to my cell. Oh, you got a problem with such and such? Come to find out who I'm speaking with is from Tampa. But we never got that far because when he came to my cell, he was already on some aggressive type shit. All right, well, yeah, fuck him. And if it's fuck him, fuck you. If you rocking with him, you know what I'm saying? Right. So he put a hit out. And he did it in front of my face. I'm in the cell. I can't get out of the bars. But he's like, hey, I got 50 on his head right now. Yeah. So I'm yelling out, who going to take the hit? Everybody's quiet. That next morning when we all lined up, <clears throat> the GDs had it. The GDs was in front of me and behind me. We going down the stairs. As I'm going down the stairs, I had a homie behind me. He wasn't blood, but he was fucking with me. I look back, whatever. I start going down the stairs, boom, I get hit. Mm-hmm. And I just felt something touch my face. I didn't feel pain, nothing. It was just like this. The quote you had was that you felt air somewhere. You had I never felt, felt I air felt before. I felt the air inside of my fucking head, bro, like in my face. Yeah, that scared me a I little bit. I didn't feel any pain or nothing like that. I touched my shit. I knew I got hit, though. So I pulled out the razor. And at the time, like I told this whole shit too, but my toenails were fucking infected from right. the last prison because of the small ass boots they gave me. So my shit bleeding, pussing, I can't walk. Medical basically told me to go fuck myself. They're not treating me until I get to the next spot. Mm. So I can't move, I can't run. 
I'm basically stationary. So when I get hit, I turn around. I'm like, all right, let's go blade for blade, you know? So he, I only got a couple steps down. He shoots off and goes into the booth where the COs are at. So if I walk, if I walk in there, they're going to grab me up because I just got hit. You know That's what I mean? a no-no. That's dishonorable, I would assume, you think? I mean, that shit pussy, bro, but you got to get mm. your lick off how you get it off. That's the way he did it. That's the way he did it. I can't take it from him. He got me. Right. My homie blasted his ass, though, at the next spot with a box cutter. Really? Everyone that hit me got hit. Because you got taken out of there soon after, so you weren't able to actually get revenge? Man, this shit was fucked up, bro. So I ended up going down to the bottom of the steps. There's a CO at the steps. We got to wear a hat. So I put the hat on as I'm coming out. Right. So he doesn't see all the blood and shit. And uh, I make it out and I'm hiding behind the pillar. So I got the raise in my hand. So when he comes out, I'm gonna splack his ass as soon as he comes out. He walks out with the CO, walking next to the CO and everything. Like they fucking best friends. I'm surprised it wasn't holding hands. Mm. So I'm like, fuck it, I can't do nothing. Cause I can't chase him. My feet are fucked up, I can't catch him. Mm. I was never fast anyways, you know what I mean? So I had the understanding that I just gotta take my lick. I throw the razor, I get in line. My shit leaking everywhere, bro. Like everyone's looking back at me, I'm bleeding all over the place. And he's a couple feet behind me in the line. I just look back at him like, yeah, all right. You know what I mean? So I walked in the chow hall. Everybody stopped eating when they seen me. The COs pulled me and they took me uh to the little fucking, the little nurse thing that had me sitting in the hallway. With a diaper on your face. With a diaper. They gave me a <laughs> diaper for the blood. Right. And I'm sitting on the bench with the dude that walked, he works in the, uh. It's like a, a little unit they got in the back of Butler where everybody's about to die. And his only job is to bag bodies. Right. This is like one of the most lifeless looking people I've ever met. No emotion, no expression. He's just telling me how he bags bodies. You know what I mean? And um, they hot glued my shit. The captain come, the white shirt. He's like, oh, you want to go back to the dorm? I'm like, yes, sir. He said, what happened? I said, I tripped and fell on the stairs. He said, all right, put me right in confinement. So they stuck me in confinement. Not on no PC shit though. I went under investigation. But I was already pending transfer. Right. So I'm already on my way to another prison. So within three days, me and everybody I got sent there with, we all went to Lancaster CI. And that's how I have the picture of me with the fresh three-day cut on my face because every new compound you hit, they take a picture. So I used that picture when I started my channel. It's the only picture that exists of me at 19 years old. Wow. And you can see the seven-inch cut. They measured it. When they you're falling, the you're right falling down. asleep that night, and you got this fresh cut on your face. What's going through your head? Oh, I was beating my dick in the cell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I ain't had no bunkie, so I'm in confinement by myself, oh, okay. getting busy. Yeah, I wasn't stressing that shit. I was just thinking about how I'm gonna get him back. Right. Yeah, I mean, I already got hit. I'm looking at it in the thing. I'm like, God damn, I hope it don't scar up this bad. You know what I mean? There's but just got to be something in your head where it's like you not only did something violent to me, like you, you could have punched me in the face, but you scarred me with something I'm going to have to look at every day for the rest of my life. And there's a good chance that if I don't get you soon, then I'm never going to get you because realistically, I'm not going to be in prison for the rest of my fucking life. I might not even know who you are or where you're at once I leave here. You want to know how I really looked at it? I looked at it as, as being blood and shedding blood for those that shed blood for me. Like, we in the field, bro. We gonna, you know, it's gonna come back and forth. I'm gonna get hit, someone else is gonna get hit. Big homies have gotten hit in the past. It just, it is what it is. As long as you stand on your shit, it's a part of the game. Right. So my whole thing was, when it's my turn, I'm gonna get him back, you know? But I never got him back. Right. I personally didn't get him, but someone else got him. But how much did it mean to you that your, your friend was able to take care of it? Oh, I was, that was my dog. Like, if that had not happened, would it still haunt you? Nah. Because I've, I've been... Past it now. I done got hit up before by someone I never got back on. Really? You know what I mean? But, so, the homie that cut him after I got cut, I got fired up in the back of my head. I got a patch missing. I got hit by a Zoe. He put a, a brick from the basketball court, the asphalt, inside of a sock. and hit me over the head and put, like, a bullet hole in my head. Uh, Just because of... Because of a specific issue with him, or was it? Nah, the, we were beefing with the Zoes. Right. We were at war with the whole compound. So the same homie that cut the other one, he got him blasted. So they did a little fake call out sheet, and they wrote up a thing to go to medical, but they put his name on it, so they knew when he was coming out. I was in confinement when this whole shit happened, so they had him come out, and then they hit him with a like a real box cutter blade, ripped his whole shit open. Wow. He back in Haiti right now. I looked him up when I got up. <laughs> you looked him up? Yeah, big dumbass guy on his face. <gasps> Holy shit. Yeah. So were you like, this whole time, were you thinking about like, I got to get out of here and I got to maybe change my life a little bit? Or are you fully just in the moment of like surviving nah, all I this shit? I wasn't even thinking about going home, bro. I didn't think about going home at all because it was just on some shit like, 
what's the point of thinking about it? I'm stuck in here. Right. You know, and shit got so crucial because my YO sentence got snatched after I got hit with assault in an inmate, possession of a weapon. I had a lot of possession of weapon on disciplinary reports. Sounds like it. So they ended up sending me to an adult prison. And they sent me to one of the most violent, fucked up adult prisons. Appalachia CI, ACI, it's called Gay CI. Bro, that, that shit there. The culture shock of the violence at the youth defenders is one thing. But when you see men acting like women and getting fucked, or when you see men looking at inmates, oh, you see that girl right there? Everybody start looking for a nurse or some shit. We're looking like, oh, where she at, where she at? The girl right there with the Reeboks. That's an inmate sneaker. He talking about a white boy. And so you show up and it's like unmistakable. There's just bro, a whole bunch up, of this shit bro, going on. My last name is Cherry. <laughs> and I'm at this fucking prison. So COs are here, the inmate Cherry. Everyone's looking, around, which one's Cherry? Me, bitch, fuck you talk about. You know what I mean? Like you got to step down on shit because like the booty bandits in there, they're on that. Right. Like they'll pull knife out and take ass, all that. Do you think it's just worse in this prison, or is this kind of like I feel like a lot of prisons you don't hear about this ACI, much of that. Right? ACI has a reputation for that shit. When I was there, they they had a a, a jit dorm, where you know a jit is a kid. That's what you call a kid in Florida. Right. So they had a jit dorm for uh, 24 and under. They shut down the jit dorm though. So when I was there, I was in confinement. They closed it. They were telling me the stories of how when the white boys hit the compound, there was. Dudes in there with they shit ready for the white boys to go in the shower. When they went in the shower, they'd literally just be standing there beating their shit, staring right at them. And them boys are scared. They're not going to do nothing about it. There was one dude who ran down on a white kid who was taking a shit. He pulled out a knife. He said, turn around, don't even wipe. He <laughs> wanted to fuck him on the toilet, yeah. Oh so the kid God. got scared, but he was like, man, I'm not turning around, I'm not turning around. So he ended up doing something else for him. And he stopped doing that. He's like, I ain't doing it no more, whatever. Dude stabbed him up. That shit was fucked up. So being white on that compound right, and then having a reputation as a gang member, because regular gang members, bro, no matter what the race was, getting airlifted off that bitch. When I was in fucking confinement, I had a view of the main entrance of Appalachia. The ambulance is pulling up, going to the wreck yard to pick somebody up. Like People were getting killed at that compound. Mm. So this was different because while I was at, we just getting cut, stabbed, whatever. Over here, people are dying. It's a different environment it's a different game what the fuck so anybody try you or how'd you end up establishing your respect in there i mean my reputation carried from the youth defender prisons so the barber in confinement was at lancaster where i was at and he put word out to all my homies so the homies was already sending me shit while i'm in confinement right so when i hit the compound i'm expecting a toh like i know they're gonna try me you know what i mean so when i got in my dorm i was closed custody i was the highest custody level you can be aside from death row so they put me in the dorm, even though I only got less than a fucking year. Maybe I had like 14 months left when I hit Appalachia. They put me in the dorm with lifers. So you got dudes, like I was in our dorm, I was in our four, so two bottom. Our one had people in there with MIPs, murders in prison. They can only be housed with another motherfucker that got an MIP. Mm. So most of these dudes would have their own cell and they act like they got a mansion. Like, yeah, I got my own room. I got an upstairs and a downstairs because they got both beds. They <laughs> can't have a bunkie because they don't kill somebody. Right. There was other dudes in there that was on death row and got off death row. You only get put on death row if you killed someone. So they would end up getting resentenced to like life or multiple life sentences. So I'm in here with the killers. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, that shit was just... I ain't really get tried because the homies already knew who I was. And my face was good, but everybody was looking at me like, are they gonna embrace him? Hmm. Are they gonna fuck him up? But everything was straight. And then once everything was straight, it was nothing. So are you forced to like be cool with these booty bandits to some extent? Nah, bro, you don't gotta no. talk to nobody you, just you don't, don't wanna talk to. Talk to. But at the same time, business is business. Right. You know what I mean? You got certain people, they gonna pimp out the ones that's acting like girls. Right. You know, or if this one's got dope, whatever, whatever, business is business. But unfortunately, there's no separation. So you finna talk to whoever the fuck in there. It's just a matter of you don't have to communicate with nobody you don't want to. Right. We don't fuck with them. Like, especially the ones that act like females, we're not gonna be in the cell with them. We're not mm. gonna interact with them. We're not gonna, none of that shit. You know what I mean? Cause it's a, it's a bad look. And are there white supremacists in this environment as well? 
Yes, and they hate me. They hated thankful. you. They hate me. See, that's what I always think about is if I got locked up, there's going to be these white supremacist dudes who are probably going to hate me for being cool with these black nah, dudes. Nah, nah, let me, let me break it down for you. They hate me because I tell it how it is. They don't run shit in Florida State Prison. Okay, yeah. And you're white, you want to be on that Nazi shit? Cool. There's no Aryan Brotherhood in Florida State Prison. Right. They got the Unforgiven. They do their thing. They really kill each other, bro. It's really like you're not going to recruit no white boy. He finna get flipped by us, by whoever. He's gonna get tried by everyone else. And if he makes the cut and he's got a little respect, then the Nazis try to recruit him. Like, oh yeah, I seen how all 12 of those black guys just fucked you up. You held it down. We didn't help you, because we're not gonna help you. But yeah, if you wanna join us, you can join us. Do they just not have the numbers? Nah, they get smacked, bro. Mm. They get killed. Like, that shit, they're not, they don't run shit. You got a few of them, though, that's rocking. Right. There's always a select few in every group, but it, they're just not like that. But there's got to be a lot of prisons where the white supremacist shit is actually like big and dangerous. I, I heard they run it in the feds. But uh -huh. this, this is the thing, though. A few of them fucked with me. Right. So one of the big names on that compound was named Country. He was an American Nazi. Swastikas all over his head and everything. He called me nephew. Mm -hmm. So he's, I was in two bottom. He was in four bottom. When I was in confinement, there was a CO that I still talk to to this day who would come up to my cell. He took me out for showers. He seen the big ass B on my tattoo, whatever. Did he not talk to you for a long time and then you got back in contact once you were free? Nah, he saw my videos. That's what I'm saying, he yeah, DM yeah, you or something? Yeah. No, yeah, I didn't, I didn't talk to him when I got out and then he saw my shit. That's pretty cool up. though. I always wonder how many people see the shit from prison and then like reconnect. Mad people yeah. have hit me up. Mm. But um, you know, he came up to my cell, he pulled me out and he's looking at the B. He's like, what are you? I was like, I'm blood. He's like, oh, you a white blood? Are you gonna die, white blood? Wait till you hit the compound. So every day he working in family, he's telling me I'm gonna die. I'm gonna get killed. Fucking with me, nonstop, you know what I mean? And every time he saw me, what's up, white blood? White blood? Cause he wanted the other inmates to hear him say it. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, he's saying he a blood. Like he wanted that reaction to get me hurt. And uh, I got cool with Country, the American Nazi who had a big name for the Nazis or whatever. So we went into Chow and he's working in the cafeteria. Me and Country walk up to him and Country introduces me. Yeah, this is Jake. He a white blood. And he's hearing it from an American Nazi. So he's just like, okay, white blood. Mm -hmm. Like it was like respect type shit. So every time he would see me, he see me with all the homies. And then at that point, like the COs really were looking at me like I'm some type of blood assassin. Cause they're like, how the fuck is this skinny white kid? Cause I was skinny in prison. How was he like officially respected by them? Like he must be tearing shit up. You know, and it's like, it kind of brought a reputation I didn't even have because at that compound, I wasn't even really doing nothing. Right. I did everything at the at the youth offenders. So when I got to the adults, I was able to like put my feet up. But as far as like the Nazis, they never said nothing crazy to me in prison. Mm. Never tried me in prison, never said anything disrespectful in prison. When I got out though, Oh, you're a clown. We laugh at people like you. Not when we're in there. <laughs> you might do it at the safety of your home, but y'all didn't say shit when I was in there. You know what I mean? Did you eat? Is there like a little bit of a conflict in your head? Because, I mean, like I had a BMX jam and a dude came up to me that was with his kids. Yeah. And I'm talking to him for a second. And after like 15 seconds, it started to click. They're like fucking iron iron cross in the middle of his forehead all this different nazi shit definitely like prison tattoos because if he got that shit on the street then he's a fucking psychopath but yeah. i felt kind of bad about even talking to this fool for five seconds like this even like having any kind of relationship with him because it's like i fuck with black people so hard that for me to even be cool with you seems like a little bit contradictory in terms of my approach is prison just different because it's so much more intense well, that was out here right yeah. All right, so one thing about the South, the South is the South, bro. You could be mm. any race, you could be anything. You're gonna fuck with Southern shit. So when it comes down to like Louisiana, Florida, all that, I knew Nazis that were listening to Boosie. Mm. Like, <laughs> really? They, yeah. Wow. They'd be bumping that shit and there'd be certain ones, that, hey brother, that ain't our music right there, boy. But nah, like there'd be certain ones, the younger ones, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the Nazis used to be like white Crips, white GDs, Went to prison, found out it, they weren't real, mm. and then joined some Nazi shit. But a lot of them really be on, like, they still listen to the same music. They like the same shit. Right. Like, they'll really be on some shit like, nah, we like black people. We just don't like Jews. Right. And they'll go bully some Jewish guy that didn't bother nobody. How um, fucking many Jewish people are these dudes really dealing with? None. Seems like such a cop out. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> picking a victim that, you know. Yeah, that is, that like, barely even there. Even there. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. All right, I probably should have said this, like, an hour ago, but how'd you meet these guys? These are the homies.
How, how long you know them? Can you mind give us an introduction? Yeah, so this 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 day one bros right here. This ratchet right here. That's a homie Sorry, from Orlando. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. This assassin right here. This is my big homie. It's good. You guys been in prison or outside? He's been in prison. Been in prison. Okay. But oh you, no, we met you, we met on the street. Okay. We met on the street, but as far as prison, he's been to prison. Once State you got out though, you, you met these guys? Yeah. Okay. So these, you know, as far as bro goes, that's for our shit, that's the biggest name. It don't get no bigger than that. Oh, okay. So everybody I brought out, like, certified, like, big names. So how many more years do you live in Florida after you got out of prison? I fucking got the fuck out of Florida. Oh, okay. Yeah, immediately. But then how'd you guys meet? We all, everybody in the same circle. Oh, okay. So everybody that I was still around when I first, high school and everything like that, it's still all the same circle. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just brought you the biggest names. <laughs> so it's like... You're not meeting the little steppers. You're meeting right. the biggest fucking names. Because I kind of remember there being like a little bit of a moment of realization with the 1090 Jake thing. Because we're all watching your videos and we know you say your blood, whatever. We're not really thinking about it that much. And then we're seeing you go to Florida. And when you're seeing you party with all these people that you're yeah. really good friends with and stuff. And like we're in the group chat sending pictures back and forth like... Look at 1090 Jake, man. Yeah, this is, this <laughs> shit well, is for well, that's, real. That's the thing is, bro. Like when I got on YouTube... When I got out of prison, I'll start there. When I got out of prison, I didn't have anywhere to go to. Right. I could have went right back to the same block that I got put on at. Mm. But I understood what would have came with it. I would have went right back to prison. So for me, I got out of prison. And that's why I really don't talk about my family like that. I had a family member who wasn't there for me as a kid. Reach out. Hey, you can stay with me. Came, got me. I get up to Massachusetts. As soon as I get here, yo, you can't live with me. So now, now what? I had 24 hours to figure it out. So I had to go into a drug program. Why'd they change their mind like that? My family do what they do, bro. That's They're why I don't really fuck with them. Wild ass people, they didn't know what the fuck's going on. It's just, uh, you know, people have their own struggles. And as I became an adult, instead of, you know, cause when you look at your parents as a kid, that's just your parents. Yeah. But when you become an adult, you look at them as an adult and the respect level changes. Mm. Cause now I'm looking at you as a man or a woman. Would I respect you if I wasn't related to you, you know? So shit, shit changes. And uh, just my people wasn't, you know, they a lot of false promises growing up, a false promise when I got out of prison. It might have been genuine, genuinely wanted to help me. And then when it came down to it, couldn't do it. So I couldn't get into a program for convicted felons in mass because I didn't do my time in mass. Mm. So I had to lie and get into a drug program and go through all that bullshit. But with YouTube, people were like, Oh, he got banned from Florida. He ain't allowed back in Florida. Oh, he ain't blood. He ain't this. He ain't that. Whatever, whatever, whatever. I go to Florida. You view me with 30, 40, 50 fucking people. And that's, you know what I'm saying? It's the same right. shit that it was before I went to prison. Definitely. So going back a little bit, when it came time, when you knew you were about to get out of prison the first time, How'd that feel? And, and you, you said you had a family member who was offering to take you in, but like, what are you actually planning on doing with your life? And you're not really thinking about YouTube at this point, I'm assuming? That was, that was one of the scariest moments of my life. Just knowing that you're going to have to figure it out on the outside? Nah, just knowing I was going home. I didn't want to go home. Mm. I was scared of going home. One of my homies that I met in prison that he actually knew from the street, rest in peace to Angel. Rest in peace, my uh, brother. We were at the Youth Defender Prisons together. And then when I went to the adult prison, he came and he's going home. So he was going home like three months before me. Then I was going home. And then my bunkie was going home three months before me. And then I was going home. We all making plans to link up on the street. He go home, he get killed. Uh, another homie at another compound, he go home. When somebody got a letter, news thing saying he got killed. You know what I'm saying? So wow. I'm literally watching people like I'm hanging out with. We have a little celebration, bro, go home. Two weeks later, we find out that they died. And even though it's only three years, it's like you kind of went in when you were a kid, and now all of a sudden you're kind of looked at as an adult by society. But yeah. meanwhile, you haven't had these three years of developing an understanding of how to get a job and pay your rent no, and shit. I, I, it's didn't like, know, you, I didn't know you, how to do none of that, bro. Yeah. But honestly, none of that was on my mind. My whole thing was I felt like I was going to go home and get killed. That was the main thing. I just felt like I was going to die. That's, that's all that was in my head. And I'm thinking about all the shit that I did on the street that I didn't get caught for. Mm. I'm thinking about all the pressure I had on the street already. Because nobody forgets when you do shit to them. So it's like every situation I had on the street, right when I get back out, it's on site. I'm broke. I don't have a gun. I don't have a knife. Can't have a gun now. Right. And, you know, 
I'm so, getting thrown back into the it's mix. It's a fucking death sentence. They're putting, like, you got to go back out into the streets yeah. in a situation. So the, the smartest thing I could do was get the fuck out of Florida. Right. I went back up to Boston. I don't know anybody up here. Did you actually have a drug Dude. problem or you just went in the drug nah, program? I never regardless. had a drug problem. Right. But I, uh, I found a lot of similarities between my struggle and other people's struggle. You know what I mean? How I might, how I might lash out one way, they lash out in another way. Mm. And I met a lot of solid ass people in there. And at the same time, a lot of people in there that were young too were looking up to me because I'm the only one that's been to prison. Mm. Versus they're from like New Hampshire, Maine, all these weird places, and they're coming down to Boston to get treatment. So it's like their first time in the city. Then they look at me tatted up. I just got out. I'm telling them the stories. They're like, holy oh, shit. But I was kind of like in a way able to talk to them in a way that they were able to understand. But it's a drug program, so are you, are you having to sit there and say you were a crackhead or some shit? Oh, fuck yeah, they had me at AA meetings and everything. So you're just like kind of imagining what Jay, it would be like? I do dope, all that, yeah. Like, <laughs> you, got, it's like you get creative with it. No, nah, like. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't saying I was a crackhead. I was just saying like I like weed and molly and shit like that, mm. you know what I mean? And throughout high school, I mean, I was fucking with beans, all that shit, so it wasn't that far off. I just wasn't like a junkie. Right. But I met a lot of solid people in that. When I went to my first AA meeting, I was in a corner, in the corner of the room, backed up. I didn't want anyone behind me. I'm still fucked up from prison. Mm. So this dude walks up to me, and he just stands in the corner next to me, puts his leg up like we on the yard or some shit. He said, how long did you do? I said, I did three years. So I just did 25. And he introduced himself to me. And he became kind of like a mentor in there. He had killed somebody and, you know, changed a lot of shit around. Got me in the gym working out again. Got me a lot more comfortable being in society. Right. So I met a lot of solid people in there. Wow. Yeah. That's dope though. But So, okay, you do this whole program and then how you kind of get on your feet after that? Uh, I moved in with my girl. Oh, okay. I moved over to Dudley Street in Dorchester. Not a new girl that you met? Yeah, out oh. there. Well, in Boston. Right. So, um, cause I was, when I got in my program, I was in Southie, right by the projects in South Boston, by Old Colony. So, uh, you know, it was by D Street. And uh, this is like the original like white projects where white people live at. You go down to Florida, bro, you tell them, oh yeah, white people in projects, they're like, where? Right. You know what I mean? But Boston, yeah, these were originally all white and they still got a lot of white people in them. Like shamrocks and shit tattooed on the buildings. So I was there and then I started bouncing around like little sober homes in Dorchester that I moved in with her. And that was like the most active neighborhood I ever lived in. That shit rough over there. Really? A lot, yeah, the whole, it's all brick buildings. Everything Section 8, emergency homes, fucking rats, roaches, everything's fucked up, everybody's fucked up, a lot of shooting and shit, so. And are you going real out of your way to stay out of trouble, or are you kind of just doing whatever? Nah, I was on the block, bro. Right when I moved over there, I went to spray paint and shit. I'm putting fucking gang shit all over the place, letting everybody know I live there. Right. Um. Yeah, I started tearing it up, I'm outside smoking and shit, posted at the corner store, I'm meeting people. You know, so I'm getting to know who's who. I meet this one kid, I stop fucking with him. And I was doing my thing, like I wasn't, I started doing some shit, you know what I mean? Like, I was hungry, just like I was hungry in prison, we started extorting shit. I was hungry out here, you know? Like I felt like shit, cause I got a girl, I can't take her on a date, I can't buy nothing. Mm -hmm. So, I start looking at all these motherfuckers out here wearing chains and shit, like bro, I bet you I can get you to take that off, I don't even gotta take it from you. Mm -hmm. I started running down on people. I ended up catching another case. They said I was chasing somebody with a gun in the back of the building. And you was know- Was that true? Hmm? That was true or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got convicted on that shit and everything. And what kind of evidence did they have? Uh, really just him saying it. Really? Yeah, none of the cameras had me on nothing. They said I put a gun in his face and you know told him to give me a shit, whatever. Um, they hit me with assault with a firearm. SWAT hit my house. They never found a gun or nothing like that. The police, so basically like, the whole of the situation popped off or whatever. And, you know, from his standpoint, I was in two different outfits. A lot of things didn't add up. They were trying to say that I tried to run down on him with the gun first and he didn't give it up. He did whatever he could do. And then they said I went back inside my shit, switched clothes and came back out. You know what I mean? So more or less what happened was Buddy had mace on him. I'm not trying to knock brains out just for this little petty shit. You know, the point isn't to fucking hurt nobody, it's to give me the shit, you know what right, I mean? Yeah. So I go back in, put put the shit up, I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna just beat his ass. I done been gassed before. I came back out, he had already called the police. Wow. So when I came back out, they ran down on me, put the guns on me, whatever. I got booked for that shit. And uh, 
the kid that I met that stayed around that block, we ended up, because I ended up getting probation. They wanted to send me back to prison. So this shit happened a year after I got out, the same month in July. So like I said, had I stayed in Florida, I would have went back to prison for fucking ever. Because Florida got the PRI, uh, the Prison Release Reoffenders Act. You do anything violent, uh, certain drug related, they double the amount of time you can get and make it mandatory. So if I had did an armed robbery in the state of Florida that's punishable by life, I would have had a mandatory life sentence. Wow. A year after getting out. But because I did it in Boston, that doesn't apply. So I ended up getting two and a half years probation uh, with a two and a half year like sentence holding over my head. So if I violated at any time, I had to do the two and a half years. So this was in 2015, 2016? I think it was 2016, yeah. Okay. Because it was a year after. So now me and this kid that I met on the same block, we're in this probation group together. We hanging out, whatever, whatever. His friend gets killed at the corner store across from where I was working at, so the pizza spot that shot him in his head. And um, I'm in my house, the street. The police got to come down the street because it's the main street. The Roxbury Police Station is further down that way, B2. And you know, I remember the night we hearing mad ambulances and shit. I'm just wondering what's going on. I'm trying to Google it. The next day I found out somebody got shot in the head, like a block down. It was him. Wow. Yeah, so the one kid that I met that I started fucking with, because I would have to take the bus from court back to my house. And I'm going through art blocks and shit. Like, I don't even know where I'm at, bro. Right. So people ask me where I stay at. I tell them where I stay at. If I tell the wrong person the wrong thing, now we into it. Even though I'm not really from there, that's where I'm at. You know what I mean? So it was a lot of that shit. So bro started giving me ride homes from uh, from court, and then he ended up getting killed. So that kind of just made me, like, look at things like, you got two choices. I can either get into some shit that I'm really not even involved with. Right. Or just focus on me. And I focused on me. Right. Yeah, because at that point, I mean, it just must feel like you're right around the corner from having to go back in for yeah, a long I, time. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I don't even know who he's beefing with. I don't even know these hoods out here. I just met him. We got cool. He was looking out for me. And I heard he got shot in his head. Wow. And his homeboy got killed right before him. They're buried together. And then one of the people that they were into it with, I knew, like, I knew someone from that side, too who wasn't directly in beef with them, you feel me? And then he ended up getting killed. So what's you trying to keep your nose clean look like? Because I know at some point here, you're gonna start working I'm in a weed just, shop. I'm just, I'm just in the house smoking shop. weed. Yeah, well that came with the probation. Okay. So with the probation, uh, I was working at a pizza place and then I got the smoke shop. And then the smoke shop was in South Boston by the Old Colony Projects. And so how, how's this part, part of your life where you're actually like, you know, making a normal living and trying to keep your nose clean? What's that like? Does it hurt your spirit to have a job? Nah, I liked it because my job is right next to the projects. <laughs> so everybody in the projects are coming to hang out. We're smoking right outside the building. It's just like we're posted up, bro. Nice. And whoever's brave enough to come in the store, I'm hooking them up. We're cool. You know, mm. I met a lot of good people in the neighborhood. Everybody's taking care of me, the corner stores, the sub shop, whatever. And uh, yeah, I was getting a check. And then I started doing my shit on the side. I was making a lot of fucking money. I became the manager. I was working like 45 hours a week. I ended up getting taken off probation early because the owner of the smoke shop used to be a lawyer. Wow. Came to court with me on my behalf to speak up on me. They terminated the probation early. And then probably like a month later, I got fired. <laughs> For what? Oh, well, I broke the sales record of the store twice. So I was one of the best salesmen they had. Right. And to be honest with you, I started telling prison stories in that smoke shop. Right. My customers would come through. We smoked some shit. And it's about where'd you get your tattoos? Prison. How much time did you do? Blah, 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 blah. And we get into the stories. Because in that first ever interview you did, that's like fresh in your mind. You're yeah, basically bro, that's like, literally, yeah. That's literally how I started telling the stories was in the smoke shop. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, now nah, I fucked up because we had a thing where we could gift cartridges. You buy a pen for $50, $40. We give you a weed cartridge with it. I started bringing my own cartridges. And I'm selling my own shit. So I'm getting it $40 a pop. But it's not like... You know, if you get two, you get it for 60. Nah, it's 40 a pop. Right. So I'm getting 100 packs, flipping them, making 4,000 off a 100 pack. The sales record plummeted. They were like, why aren't we selling anything in the store? They figured it out and they fired me. Ah, when you look back at that, how does that make you feel? Just knowing that you were, you had this guy give you a big opportunity and you just couldn't help yourself. Nah, they, they, they abused their power though. They oh, wanted really? me to work overtime. They wanted me to do mad shit. They weren't trying to give me time off. And mm. um, they knew I needed the job because of probation. So once probation got taken off, I didn't really care. I was like, all right, well, fuck it. And then when probation, you know, when all that shit ended, now I'm sitting at home, I got my daughter, 
And I stopped watching YouTube. Mm. And I stopped seeing these prison stories and shit. And I seen this fucking, this interview, Lockdown 23 and 1 was interviewing this white kid in Virginia that said he was a blood in prison, but he's not a blood anymore. Okay. And he's talking, using lingo and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> so I hit up Lockdown 23 and 1. I tried to hit him up direct. He ain't respond. He put a comment. He said, yo, anybody with a story, I wrote a whole bunch of shit down. Everybody went to liking it. And that's how I got the interview. So the prison YouTube scene, was this something that people were talking about in prison at this time? Or was Fuck it, no. this is the very, very beginning of it? Nah, sort I of... never heard of it, bro. I don't even think the, the main dude that started it was this dude named Joe from Virginia after prison show. I forget when he started it, but I never heard nothing about it. The first interview I seen was this guy named uh, Brian Bruton, mm. who actually lives out here. That would be a fire mm. interview. He escaped Florida State Prison. Oh, I got to check him out. Yeah, no, nah, he's fire. His story is fucking nuts. He's one of the only people that escaped and didn't get killed after the fact. Wow. Went to prison for a body, all type of shit. I watched his interview with Big Herc yeah. from out here. Yeah. Shout out Big Herc. Yeah, and that's how I, uh, he didn't want to interview me, though. He thought I was glorifying violence. <laughs> but shout out to him, though. He be doing his thing. I that understand. Is, he got a bigger message. Glorifying violence is kind of your thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe glorifying isn't the word. but I don't know about glorifying, but, bro, my bid was violent as fuck. Yeah. So I can't tell you about what I went through without speaking on the violence. And I'm not going to act like I'm sad about what I did to people. Right. They weren't sad when it happened to me. But so, okay, you... Get in touch with 23 and 1, and he does the interview. And yeah. how did you feel going into that? Because it's got to be kind of a weird feeling. I'm like, scared as fuck. You've only really talked to people one on one, a few people at a time. All of a sudden, you're doing a video and you're thinking it's going to at least get 10,000 views. Right Bro, now, I think it I has was, one and was, a half million. But. I was shook. I was nervous as fuck. I almost told him I'm not going to do it. Really? Yeah, the only reason I did it was because I was thinking about all my homies that's in prison. How would I be able to talk to them on the phone and be like, oh, I didn't do the interview? Right. You know, I got an opportunity that they don't have. So I took the opportunity. Nervous as fuck, but I don't regret it. Yeah. I mean, you really like even that being your first time on camera to me watching it now, it's so obvious that you had it in you to be a great YouTuber because, you know, sometimes you ask somebody a question and they'll give you a five second answer. And sometimes you ask somebody a question and they'll just start talking for a half hour. Yeah. And I'll it's, talk to you. yeah it's like, if you, if you yeah. have that thing in you where you can just elaborate on any topic for a long period of time, then you're probably going to be a pretty good YouTuber. Well, prison gave me that because I did, I did over 300 days straight in confinement, mm. you know, like when you getting into it, you're going to be in the box. And, um, it's just like if me and you were sitting in the cell, bro, we have nothing to share about our life stories. Right. And that's literally what I started to do was every new bunkie I get, we go life story, spit the whole thing. And that's how I got good at sharing these stories. Right. I just never knew anything about YouTube. But even now, like doing the interview right now, I'm not used to like all the cameras and shit because when I do my videos, I'm in control. Right. I can say something. I can burp and stop the video and restart it versus when cameras is on me, it's like... Mm. It still feels different. I'm not used to it, bro. Right. But you know, got to ride out with it now. That that first interview that you did, w then you do a part two. And on part two, you're geeked because you're like, yo, that part one got 60,000. Yeah, this shit busting. Which is kind of crazy because that was 1.5 million yeah, now. But to it, me, it, that back then it was felt like 1.5 yeah. million. Oh, shit. Like, this shit's really. Right. And I had a, a brother. I had so much support off the first interview. That's what made me start a channel. I had no intention on starting a channel. I just seen this kid that said he was a white blood. I was like, you a fucking dub. Let me tell my story. And everybody was like, yo, start a channel. Like, we fuck with your shit. Right. And I popped it off. And it just started blowing up from the very beginning. You didn't have that any shit, problem? That shit blew up immediately. That right. shit was going up. Everything I was dropping was just like fire. That's dope. Yeah. That's good to hear, man. Sometimes like when you hear about people starting YouTube channels and it just works from day one and like that, a lot of big YouTubers have told me that. But at the end of the day, bro, it's respect to Lockdown 23 and 1. Because mm. if he never interviewed me, and even he was telling me to, to do an interview, I mean to uh, start a channel. If he never did that, I would have never did this. Right. So, you know, even though me and him, we, ain't, we don't fuck with each other now. Right. It's still respect for that initial put on. Well, when did that stress in that little relationship start? I mean... That's, that's really the reason that I didn't do interviews anymore, was uh, he instigated a lot of situations. Because you did how many interviews with him? Four, three? With him, we did two interviews, but one of them was turned into two different videos. Okay. So it was only two things that we did together. Um, oh no, I think he brought me on for another one, asking me about how I would be in California State Prison. 
but more or less, he, I didn't even know he, he did it like this, but he interviewed Pino. Uh-huh. And the first question asked, oh, you know about 1090J? I heard y'all was at the same prison. So after me and Lockdown 23 and 1 did that interview, he started bringing on all these people asking him, hey, what do you know about white bloods? What do you know about white bloods? And to me, I'm looking at it like, you just want somebody to say I ain't real, mm. to pop something off. You know what I mean? Because I'm telling you that, and I can bring on people that was in prison with me. You can interview them and hear it from them, but you're looking for an outside source to tell you some shit about me. So he interviewed Pino, and that's the thing. You interviewed Pino, and you said, how did it pop off? He said, I started talking about him. Mm. Ain't how it happened. Lockdown 23 and 1 asked him, does he know me? Right. So he started saying, oh, well, when I was at Appalachia, there wasn't no white bloods. They had a strict rule about that shit. He ain't lying. It's just, I'm official. <laughs> That's just what it is. Right. Uh, and then he said, if I was there when he was there, I must have been low custody. I was closed custody in Adon the whole fucking time. So what that did is it created a situation where you got one person saying we was at the same spot, and it's kind of got other people like, oh, so he must be lying about everything that he said, mm. right? Me and Pino spoke. And we did a little uh, a interview together. We did a video and we was cool. And come to find out, I left prison in 2015. He wasn't in prison until 2016. Right. We were never at the same spot. So when I talked to him about it, I was like, how did that come about with the interview? And he said, Lockdown 23 and 1 did it like that. Mm. So I feel like he tried to instigate that situation that turned into what it turned into. Do you think because you were like one of the biggest, most viral things that he had going, that he was kind of thinking like, the next most viral thing I could do is to have somebody say something against yeah, this guy. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. Because mm. we got into a couple of the situations with him. It's like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Like, you fuck with me, or you, you don't. It's so one or the other. You know what I mean? Like, if you fuck with me, you fuck with me. But why does it feel like you keep trying to get somebody to say something? And then when I step to him, it's like, nah, it's nothing like that, bro. It's nothing like that. Da da da. So it's like, I kind of just realized people do little flaky shit. They're gonna do it behind closed doors, regardless. Mm. So it just, just stop fucking with each other. Right. At that point, it's like, who the fuck are you gonna bring on that's gonna talk about me? You know what I mean? Because I can bring on motherfuckers from other gangs that'll tell you what I was doing. I've right. done it. I've interviewed my ops on my shit that'll tell you, but yeah, like, it's respect on both sides. We didn't beef with bitches, bro. We beef with motherfuckers that was on there. Right. We were both getting hit up. So at the end of the day, you're gonna have some type of a mutual respect for that. Right. So then how, how does the Pino thing go from you guys having a conversation and being cool to what happened later? Hey, big Ola, let me get that paperwork, twin. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you. Yes. Big Ola. So more or less what happened was, before I even take this out, somebody dropped the video saying he was snitching with his paperwork. So I called him. I'm like, hey, bro, I got the affidavit and everything. Your co-defendant name, da-da-da? He's like, yeah. Y'all did this? He's like, yeah. You implicated your co-defendant? Nah. So everything else I just asked you is official, but the last part you don't like ain't officially. Nah, I ain't do that. All right, well, he just dropped the video saying you did, so, you know, tighten that shit up. Because it was on some shit like everybody was hating on Florida prison channels. Because mm. a lot of us fuck with black culture. Right. Black people, they didn't like that shit. I wanted to unify the Florida prison channels. And at the time, it was me, K Frog TV, who I honestly feel like would be a good interview because he's going to give you the third perspective mm. of us. In so this many shit. people hit me up, up, up about him over the nah, years. Bro, yeah. You got you to gotta bring him up, bro. At the end of the day. No Mighty gotta, Mouse? Nah, the sex offender. I don't know why he didn't bring him here with you. Like, he was, Pino rode around here with him. Yeah. He should have came too. Yeah, he fucked a little kid. I seen that on YouTube. I don't know the, nah, he the fucked, details, bro. but all right, I know the details. Fourteen-year-old little girl in a hotel on a period. Yeah, Jeez. the fucking police went to the school and interviewed her. It's a whole sex offender. He just think because that shit big, the motherfuckers ain't gonna. He tried to uh link up with the homies because yeah, we got to, the uh, Tampa box and he tried to come down. Yeah, a whole phone call got all that shit dubbed out. A fact. Yeah, nah. Really? That yeah, shit. That's we ain't fact. playing that shit. Is he still doing his boxing shit out there, or that's not? I don't pay attention to him, bro. That's mm, Pino's okay. people. <laughs> well, they but, fell uh, out too, though, right? Yeah, because everybody got on his ass. He used them for security out here. Right. I don't know why he ain't tapping with the Hoovers. 
He they put, went there, didn't they? He put, no. I don't think they tapped in with He, he went to the art block. Mm. <laughs> he went to a whole nother block. <laughs> he don't know no fucking hoovers, but we gonna get into all of this, bro. Right. So, uh, you know, more or less, I hit him about the paperwork and I'm telling him to get that shit together. Show people that you ain't snitched, bro, because I'm fucking with you. Mm. So I feel like you were a reflection of me. And that's why I fucked up at. I shouldn't have felt like that. I could have just cut ties with him and let his situation be his. But instead, I felt like it was mine. Right. So I got more involved with it. He was on some shit like, man, I don't even care about that. I talked to K-Frog, I hit up Pino, and I'm like, look, you either delete your channel or I'm gonna put the paperwork out. He folded, and I was honestly surprised. I didn't think he was gonna fold that easy. He deleted his channel? He deleted the fucking channel. You delete a channel, you got 30 days to sign back in. He deletes the channel, I didn't know. So K-Frog hit me up, he's like, yo, he ain't taking it down, you gonna post the paperwork? So K-Frog do his little sneaky shit too. You know what mm. I mean? He do some sneaky shit. And uh, I dropped the paperwork. So when I dropped the paperwork, everybody's trying to look up Pino's channel and it's gone. Like, oh, he really deleted it. Oh, he a bit. Oh, he this and that. Now they're thinking it's even more official because it's gone. Right. Then he brings it back. He does a video with some papers that he has saying, this is my discovery. Da -da 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 -da. This shows I didn't snitch. I'm the one that told him to go get his discovery. I'm like, look, you go get your discovery. It's gonna prove you didn't tell nobody because it's gonna have all the facts in the paperwork. You know what I'm saying? At the time, Broward County was closed. The county clerk, because of COVID, uh -huh. you couldn't get your paperwork. So how the fuck did you just get the discovery? He wasn't showing a discovery, just showing random shit. But nobody on the internet knew better. So for me, being that we kill all rumors and all bullshit, I contacted the state attorney, the ones that go against you. And what I did is I got the case file. And I even went a step further and got you your own official copy <laughs> of Pino's paperwork with your name on it. So I got a, I got, it does say my name, yeah. I got a couple of I got a couple of highlighted things that I want to you know go over with you. Okay. This paper that we looking at, this is the paperwork that I saw. So Brandon Smart, mm -hmm. that's Pino. They basically broke into a house, stole a laptop, another laptop, another laptop, a guitar, a Wii. They're on some junky shit, you know what I'm saying? Just mm. hitting licks, whatever, whatever. Says the defendant Smart was arrested at his residence. The defendant directed detectives to one of the stolen computers and implicated the co-defendant Gonzalez in the burglary. That's the paperwork, right? That's it. Uh, so you asked him about that, and he said, oh, that's what the police said. I never gave nobody a statement. You'll never find a statement on me. But so you're saying that he told on the girl that he was with? He told on the girl. Okay. He implicated his co-defendant in the burglary. So when we slide right. to page two, this just talks about how he was arrested hiding under a bed in between two sets of drawers. Right. We slide over to page three. Him and one of the co-defendants were discussing burglaries, popping cars, stealing laptops, whatever. Now, at this bottom pot, would you be able to read that, bro? At 2.35, I interviewed Brandon Smart. I advised him of his Miranda rights, which he had waived. Smart admitted to his participation in the burglary to the victim's residence at the blank community. He also identified his friend Matthew Mueller and stated he did not know Rebecca's full name. Smart provided information about Rebecca and her boyfriend, Raymond. I was able to identify Raymond Doucette as being Rebecca's boyfriend. Smart agreed to escort investigators to Doucette and Rebecca's residence. All right, so just Brand just man. just staying with that, though, not even Good. going to the next page yet. Right. How do you feel? Well, keep it know, gangster. I mean, I guess the cop could be lying, but yeah, that does sound pretty uh, All right, so pretty now, indicative so now, of telling. So now, yeah. so now let's hit the next page. You want to read it? Jake really get me. You, right I, I mean, <laughs> hey, we, we, we might be able to we might be able to do a new little news thing, paperwork party or something. I can read this shit too. I so feel, this is how Wack One Hundred feels on Clubhouse every night. Yeah, <laughs> so hey. this is very like well laid out he, and highlighted. He, he oh, oh yeah, I made sure it was professional for you, bro. <laughs> All right. So you know, basically, this one gets into questioning him about the burglary. He stated he was aware of the burglary and that Rebecca committed it, right? Right. Smile stated Rebecca stole the laptop, so he's blaming everything on her. Mm. This is where shit get good, though. Smart directed me and detective whatever to 9th Ave, at which time we met with his neighbor, blah, blah, blah. They confirmed they got the laptop. He gave up the laptop, and that was the laptop he said that he stole. Mm -hmm. So then it says Smart directed me and the detective to Raymond Doucette's residence. So this motherfucker went on a field trip with the police, pointing out his co-defendant's houses. He didn't yeah. know Rebecca's name. He said, I know where she stays at. And he was escorted, or it actually says he escorted the police. So you got Pino 
107 Hoover sitting in the back of a police car saying, yeah, that's where she stays at. That's who stole the shit. Then they go in there and they get the stolen shit. Yeah, that's the shit that she stole. Wow. I mean, there's no fucking confusion. Yeah. I, I conducted a, a videotaped interview with Rebecca. I allowed Mueller and Smart to participate in the group discussion. They, moni they monitored the discussion. Brandon was heard discussing details of the burglary. Da, da, da. Just tell them you bought the guitar. And then this last piece of paper. This is a copy of him signing off on his Miranda warnings, saying that he's willing to speak to the police without an attorney. And those are his signatures, the B and the S. So wow. this is actually him signing off on the paper saying, yes, I would love to talk to you and ride around in the back of the police car. You can keep that. I don't know if you want to hang it you up, frame put this it, in the whatever Najabra, you want to do. But... Najabra Museum? <laughs> yeah. We're fact. in the paperwork business yeah, now. That's, that's, that's a fact. That's just for you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, the whole thing that I pride myself on with my channel, bro, is I take it a step further. I don't wait on the news or nothing when they report shit. I go and actually produce as much facts as I can. That's the thing I like the most about your channel, to be honest. Is that you just actually take the next step of really investigating and finding out whatever you can. You'll always have a Facebook link and check out this picture of him from four years ago where he's doing this. And mm -hmm. I'm like, man, Jake actually dialed the fuck in and Bro, found out everything he could. People don't know how long it takes me to just do one video. It's mm -hmm. all research. But I really like being able to produce shit like that because at the end of the day, if someone says, oh, you, oh your information's fucked up. This is what really happened. Why are you telling me what really happened? Right. Because all I know is what the police know. So anything you know, you're giving up information. Right. See what I'm saying? I can read all this shit. This can't hurt your case. I can read Melly's case. It can't hurt his case. Everything I'm reading mm. is what's already known to the police. Yeah, definitely. So no, nobody the, can really say nothing A lot of times it. I don't even like pay attention to some of the paperwork conversations when they're happening on Clubhouse and shit because it's, it's very like he said, she said, like you never really see the paperwork laid out like this. Oh, like, wait, this wait, is pretty convincing. Wait, wait you know? till next week. I got another big rapper I'm about to blast too. Somebody sent me his shit. Really? Yeah, so I'm in tune with a lot of different people, especially in the rap world, and they'll send me the paperwork or just the name. Mm of whatever person it is, and I look into it, and boom, that shit gets handled. So you posted about this type of shit at that time, so you, you made a whole video airing out Pino, saying he's a snitch, et cetera. Then how does that end yeah, up? So Where does it go from there? Me and K-Frog made the video, made our own videos, whatever, whatever. So him and K-Frog started getting into it, pulling up in each other's blocks, like doing videos when they're not there. So it's like on some like 6 9 shit. Like, right. oh, on my yeah, side, where you at? Water, oh, on my side, where you at? Um, neither one of them from a hood. K Frog from Davy. Pino is from Margate, Florida. It's an old <laughs> retirement home. Mm. None of his paperwork from back until he was like 13, he ever lived in Pompano. So I'm not really even gonna call him Pino anymore. I'm gonna just say Brandon Smart. Because he's not he's not from fucking Pompano. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. But you go to prison, you wanna claim a hood to sound official. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I understand it. But K Frog was his boy, so he'll tell you. His nickname was Crack. It wasn't Pino, everybody knew him as Crack. I don't know why, but K-Frog, that was actually his boy. So he can give you more of the information I can on that. They pulling up to each other's blocks, acting like they beefing, whatever, whatever. Pino says he's coming to Boston. So I'm like, all right, I'm with it. So I stopped posting because I wanna, I wanna boost it up. I want you to feel like you can't not pull up now. Mm. I want you to pull up. I'm eager to run into you. Like I, I want to do this. And at this point, you've been out of prison for a couple of years. Yeah. And you're living a clean lifestyle for the most part. You're not scrapping with people. You're not breaking the law too much. Not really, nah. Right. But I wasn't really making money, so I didn't really have. This is the thing, right? Like <clears throat> when everything came down to it. Cause he didn't come to Boston for whatever reason he is. It was, his homeboy was going to Michigan to go handle something. He basically jumped in the car. Mm. Feel me? I had the understanding already in my mind on how far I'm willing to go with this and what I'm willing to lose. And I was able to accept, or I already had accepted all consequences. I can't have a gun, I'm a convicted felon. If I bring a knife to a fight, I gotta use the knife. Cause if we're fighting and the knife fall out, now he got the chance to grab it. Mm. I can't bring anything with me. You know what I'm saying? Same time, if he come to Boston and get his shit pop, who the fuck they gonna think did it? Me. Cause you already posting yeah. your whole fucking trip. Before I was even on anything, he's oh I'm coming to Boston, I'm coming to Boston. You're letting everybody know, bro. It's all laid out You're for doing the cops, it for the yeah. internet. Yeah, so he gets smoked out here, they picking me up first quarter. So it's like, not only that, you got some other 
I don't even know who the fuck the dude was that was driving, and then you got his girl with you. So you brought a civilian bitch with you for what? The only thing in my mind is you got someone that can tell, and then you can be like, oh, well, she's a civilian. There's no consequence. So you got a rat with you, you already a rat, whatever it is. So in my mind, it's like, we're gonna fight, I'm gonna pop out, and what I did is I popped out outside, I went live on my fucking block. This is where I live at, bro. My block busting. Every corner got fucking cameras on it and shit, shot spotters. Police are driving through nonstop. This is the block. This is an actual hood. This isn't my gate, Florida. This is Dudley Street in Dorchester. People die here every fucking year. And Dorchester, for the record, if you grew up in the New England area, you kind of know Dorchester as being like the worst part it's of like Boston. It's like Boston's Compton, bro. Like yeah. everybody know we got a reputation. You know what I'm saying? So it's like people know what it is over here. Every corner you see the flowers and the candles and shit from motherfuckers that got killed. It's rough, so you know, I know where he's pulling up to. And at the same time, there's fucking cameras everywhere. We can't really shake nothing that ain't gonna be on camera. So you know, I'm on live for 40 something minutes, showing the corner that I'm on. I'm on Dudley Street in Howard or whatever. This is Dudley Park. Pull up, pull up, da da da. They're trying to get in contact, find out where he's at. I'm looking around. I don't got nobody with me. My neighbors is outside. They're packing groceries and shit. So my neighbors walk up with me while I'm on the live. They're talking to me. But like I said, this is the block, bro. You got people walking down the street, whatever, whatever. I'm not with nobody, lifting my shirt. I don't got nothing on me. You wanna throw hands, we gonna fight, bro. Cause you been dying to fight K-Frog. So we're gonna run it, you know what I'm saying? We get that fade in, whatever, whatever. And uh, he was in the back of the building the whole time, packed, watching the live off his homie's phone. Oh, wow. So when I walk into the back of the building, I see him standing there. So he, oh yeah, don't put the phone down now. Nah. Oh, what the fuck, I'm gonna record with one hand and fight with the other. I don't got nobody with me, like I said. So I put my shit down, I popped the fight off. I popped it off. I went off in his shit, you feel me? We stopped fighting. I tried to, I got hit. I'm like, okay. And you know, I, we we both, da da da, real quick. It wasn't like we really like stood up and box type shit. Like shit was over fast as fuck. I go to twist him over the curb and he twists. He ended up getting on top of me. He hit me like one time. I got hit like three, four times the whole fight. And he had brass knuckles on? That's what they say. Mm. That's what he told you? That's what I believe I saw online. But respect for you not confirming. I mean, if that's what they said, mm. I don't fucking, you know what I'm saying? All I know is we fought. Right. And uh, we handle our situation or whatever. I get up, I see I'm leaking. I'm bleeding and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, so. Whatever he did with the video, that bitch got chopped and screwed, whatever, whatever. I'm talking shit the whole time. Mm. I'm talking about the bitch. Da, 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 da. So I was like, all right, fuck it. We're going to run it again. You feel me? I'm up close on the female that's recording. So he's like, all right, back up, back up. You hear that in the video. He said, back up. So I backed up. When I backed up, he cut the camera off. Mm. What happened that nobody knows about, because even after he did the shit with you and posted the little snippet, I was like, why didn't you post the whole thing? Runs off into the car, rips open the door, jumps in it as I backed up the square off with him again. Cause I'm already split, so I don't really, can't get much worse than that. You know what I'm saying? I rip open the car door and go in there to hit his ass. He hits one of these. <clears throat> so he, he's climbing over his homie who's already panicking. And his homie, whatever he do, he's telling his homie to do something. His homie does what he do. I back up off the whip. Mm. And that's how they pulled off. Wow. Yeah. So that's what it was. So like I said, I already accepted anything that's gonna come with it. If you gotta use something, if you gotta jump me, if you gotta do whatever you gotta do, it's only gonna make you look some type of way. Cause I'm willing to fight, win or lose, whatever it is. Right. We're gonna get it in. Given the way that it panned out, cause like one thing that we said when we were kind of observing the scenario is like, we were sort of surprised like, if we were to ever be in a situation where we were gonna fist fight somebody, we would make sure that there was somebody there with a gun. Was that like not a consideration or you just had completely counted that out and you just said, fuck, it we're gonna fight? It wasn't a consideration because I'm thinking to myself, how am I gonna bring somebody into this situation? Right. Right, like what am I hit up? How's that gonna work, bro? I'm dealing with somebody that's certified on paperwork on tail and then tells on their fucking self. Mm. So what? They got something, we got something, we get the blow and it's, gonna, it's all going bad. But not only that, as publicized as it was, I wasn't willing to do that. I got a daughter, bro. I'd rather take a sky than take a bit at this point. So it's like, my whole thing was just handle it. However it happens, it happens. 
I knew I wasn't dealing with a killer. Mm. This ain't no certain shit get treated certain ways. You got real gangsters that'll hit you up privately and be like, hey, lock my number in when I get there. I'm gonna right. drop that Addy and we gonna handle it. And it doesn't, only camera makes it on as the fucking news. You but, know, so. So then the internet starts going crazy about it though and he's posting about it and shit. Like, you seem like somebody who would not expose the details of this or you wouldn't necessarily want to draw a ton of attention to it, but you probably want to draw some attention to it because you want to put out your version of the story. How, how do you handle it from there? I got sent a picture from K Frog of him saying, I want $10,000 or I'm gonna drop the video. And he posted a picture with his hands. Right. So I jumped on live saying, drop the fucking video. Cause I wanted people to see how it really went. <clears throat> I know how it went. And that's why I felt like I was satisfied. You know, obviously pride is a motherfucker. Pride is the downfall of a lot of men. Mm. Certain shit, so you know, for me, my biggest learning experiences all came from losses. This was a loss at the end of the day. I didn't win the fight, right. no matter how it went. But it was a learning experience too. Cause now it's like, what do I do? Do I smoke them? Do I go back to prison? Mm. Fuck everything up? Or do I wait it out? You know, two and a half years down the line, I'm doing a no jumper interview, making 60 grand a month off YouTube <laughs> with a $100,000 fucking chain on. For sure. Up, so, you know, bleh, bleh. shit get different while other motherfuckers still sitting broke. Right. But. But then when he did catch a gun case or whatever recently, violated his probation stupid six bitch. months ago. Listen, you, you, 1090 you Jake comes through and makes you, a little video you, about it as you, if you didn't already have a little bit listen, of a grudge against the guy. You yeah. wanted a gun case that bad that at 30 <laughs> something years old, you make your baby mother record you at a gun range. While you're on probation. And then you can't even unjam the motherfucker. You gotta get the dude to help you. The same dude that pointed you out to the police. Like you don't even know how to, and you got the nerve to say, I keep it on me. Mm. Come on, bro. At a gun range? I just, right. I had to do a video. That was the stupidest shit I ever heard. Was there a little bit of you, though, that was like, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna kick a guy while he's down? No. <laughs> no. You wanted the attention. <laughs> right. And I pride myself on knowing, no disrespect to you, but the biggest video on YouTube with his name in it is my video. This is true. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, because I know he was excited about how much views, uh, Y'all's interview got. I hope he's excited about the amount that I got him too. Right. Do you um when you look at that situation though, does that impact or change how you deal with other YouTubers going forward? Because especially as you get bigger and bigger, there's just gonna be a nonstop list of people that are gonna want to use you for a come up, right? Yeah, that's why I stopped doing interviews and shit. That's why I stopped doing a lot of things, cause it's just like people wanna use you for what they can use you for. They usually don't even like you to begin with. And uh, later on, it gets exposed. So I found a way where I can create content mm. without needing anybody, except for really needing them to fuck up. Once something happens, I can create content. Yeah, like how, how long did you do YouTube before you decided that you wanted to kind of start talking about other people's shit as opposed to little, just your tales? A little over a year. Mm. It was, uh, excuse me, it was accidental. <laughs> I did a video on this kid from Palm Beach that was a rapper, and him and this other girl went into a 7-Eleven. They tried to rob it. A white lady felt brave, like a real Karen. You stop that, you know, and she ended up getting shot and killed. And I just put Palm Beach rapper arrested for this. Because I put rapper in the title, that bitch blew up. Right. So it was that, I was like, what if I really start tapping into these rapper cases? Mm. And you know, this is another thing too, right? As far as getting the paperwork, I'm not putting out rumors. I'm not putting out opinions. I'm putting out the facts on the paperwork. Cause at the end of the day, a lot of channels that do this type of shit, they don't show face. Mm. And when they don't show face, they're able to make mistakes, right. able to put out lies and rumors because it doesn't come back on them. Yeah. You can run into me, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. she can get political, even from a gang point. I think that's a big part of what makes your channel so intriguing to people is that you are putting yourself out there and that you just, you clearly just are what you are. You're saying what you are and you're not afraid to insert yourself into this conversation. And there's like a certain amount of respect you kind of have to give you off rip because of that. I mean, I would hope they would give that respect because I give that respect, you know, even when I touched down on somebody's case, like I broke down Bortland shit. People were trying to say he snitched. He ain't never snitched. Mm. I ended up getting on the phone with Bortland. He respected the fact that I did the video. The track situation uh, came up with a piece of paper saying track handed over the phone. 
mm. to the state attorney's office. So when I did a video on it, Ooh, this was a big one. Yeah, it was a big one. And in that thing, you said, you know, Jake should have had his facts together, this and that. And you're not wrong, but that's what that piece of paper says. Mm. And you can go on the website and find that piece of paper. <coughs> Me and Track did an interview about it. We spoke on the phone, man to man, whatever, all respect to him. And uh, later on, new documents have just come out in the Melly case. I did a video on it. And the paper actually said they were tracking the phone before Track even got to the office. So he got there and they knew they that it was in. They knew he had it and they had a warrant, just like he said. Mm. He never lied about nothing. So I respect the bro. He held it down. And he's actually, they trying to say he participated in a lot of shit regarding the murder case, even accusing him of getting rid of the murder weapons. Sending money to the girlfriend to All keep her mouth shit, shut. Bro. So, you know, we don't in, know what's true. The, in but... the situation that he is, being that he's a businessman, a professional, and a manager, he's holding it down mm. because he could have been like a lot of motherfuckers that would have just went to pointing fingers as soon as they hear that they're being accused of some shit. Right. But he's holding it down. So, you know, but I clarified that and, you know, let it be known like, nah, what he said originally was facts. Right. I, I think it's w funny when you look at like a lot of YouTubers' early days. There's a lot of story times usually. Even for me, when I look back at my early videos and stuff, it's just like cringy as fuck. Cause I'm like, oh my God, I got like a fucking video of me talking about punching my fucking college roommate in the face for saying the N word around me and shit. And like, you know, you just are, you end up going through all your tales. Yeah. And then at a certain point, it's, it's cool to see that you made the transition where you realize like, well, I don't have to talk about myself. I could talk about everything else that's going on and really add some value to it. And that's what's cool about your shit is that it's, it's always separated into two parts, that there's like the factual information and then there's your opinion. Yeah. But you really, you know, you, you have the legs to stand on to have an opinion, whereas a lot of people really are not bringing anything to that scenario. Yeah. And then the first part, the informational part, is usually above and beyond what you would expect from the average YouTuber because you can tell that you've actually done a significant amount of research. Yeah, so I mean... Me, we, just, that's the I best like defense against the most obvious criticism, which is like, oh, you, you're supposed to be a gangster, but you're out here talking about everybody else's business. But when it's well-researched and it's all official-ass information, then it's like, well, what am I well, really well, doing? That's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, uh, that's what Milk7 Phobe is saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jake the police, because he talks about paperwork, this and that. That's how I know. Like, how the fuck are you even a prison channel? You, you only went to jail. You got beat up by some Nazis. That's the only shit you ever did. Like... I don't even know how to, I don't know, bro. I know the Hoover's fucking with him now, whatever, whatever. That's cool for them. Fuck him specifically. I don't really know none of the other ones, but he the only one that just stay with somebody's name and they fucking mouth. And it's like, you don't even know how your own prison system works, bro. Y'all check paperwork out here. Mm. We don't check paperwork in Florida State Prison. We don't have paperwork. When you get to prison, they throw all, all your shit away. Like, your shit gets fucked up, but the seals will come in and gas all your property, fuck everything up. Like, we don't even have the shit. Versus out here, they check paperwork. We want to know if you a rat. We want to know if you this, that, and the third, whatever, whatever. So it's like, bro, I'm literally checking paperwork, going off the most valid source of information. Right. Like, you can't say nothing about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, did it take you a while to kind of arrive at the style that you have now? In terms of, like, you know, your shit is very clean. It's very high quality. And then it just seems like the whole formula that you have at this point is pretty well thought out and easy for you to sort of replicate. I know you spend a lot of time in your videos, but yeah. did it take you a while to arrive at that? And, and do you feel like you're kind of fixed on this style of content or, or do you see yourself adding more to it, your videos? I, I like this for this channel. Mm. Uh, I want to do a second channel, start getting into some different shit. Um, but as far as like where I'm at, I don't think there's much more I could do to make it that much better. Yeah. Maybe like graphics or some shit. Right. But it took me a little bit to get to where it's at, to learn everything, to learn how to put everything in because my channel is 100% run by me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because I almost assumed at a certain point I was talking to you and I thought that you might have had somebody helping you do the scripts nah. and shit. You're so like, this no. Is, this is the thing. And when people ask me like, yo, can you help me get on? Can you help me do this? Can you help me do that? How much are you willing to do for you? Because mm. I learned how to record, edit, Everything myself. Every fucking thing I do is me. So last year off YouTube, I made 545000 That's mine. It goes straight to me. But that's why I got bro sitting next to me. He be rapping. You feel me? That's not my artist because I know you said that at one point. But this is somebody. Oh, because that's you're the video that we played the other exactly. day on stream. Exactly. Okay, okay. Now I get He's it. He's in some of the videos too. He just right. made quite a few of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? But with bro, <clears throat> that's him. 
he stands on his shit. He built his name. Right. He 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 knows how to make it shake for himself. And that's a flaw with a lot of other people is they want to put on. They want you to do it for them. And then when they got to stand up for themselves, they can't. They crumble. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's why me and bro, we aside from being homies and all that, on a business tip, he be doing his shit. Right. You know what I mean? And that's the same thing with me. Like I learned how to do every single thing my fucking self and got it to where it's at. That 540k. How, do you know how much you made from YouTube the year before that? Uh, it was over 100,000. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a six-figure felon. Man, you'll probably you'll probably be way over the 500k. Uh, yeah, it goes up this every year. time. Yeah. Well, I just dropped a hundred on this. That's pretty fucking dope. Yeah. But so, how does it feel just being in that position to make a half a million dollars in a year when I assume that you probably never even had a dream of making? A hundred grand in a year, I right? Feel, I feel blessed, bro. And it took me back to a lot of shit. So <clears throat> the reason I went to prison, my aunt that took me in, she's gay. She's got a wife. Her wife's brother owns a big house. He tried to be like a positive male role model, whatever. Took me to a gun range before. We just did little shit together. He got probably 50 guns in this fucking house. Mm -hmm. So it was a time where I didn't give a fuck about nobody. I didn't care about... You know, I didn't respect that you earned your shit, you worked for it. I didn't have an understanding on working a job at that point. So I went and hit his house for the guns. Uh, that's that's the case I went to prison for, is I caught a gun, I got caught with one of the guns that linked me to the burglary that my co-defendant snitched. Oh, uh, okay. So, more or less, I had a piece of paper that told me the total value of everything that was stolen. It came out to like $8,900. We got accused of hitting for 15 guns and a whole bunch of other shit. So once I really got the bag off of YouTube and secured it, and I've never told this publicly. This is the first time I've ever talked about it outside of family. Um, but I feel like it's good to let people know this type of shit. I hit up my aunt because I was coming down to Florida and I brought 10,000 in cash. Right. And I surprised her with it. And I said, I want you to give this to so-and-so. And I don't want him to know it came from me. The same way that his property was stolen from him is the same way I want the money to just appear. I don't, I'm not looking for a thank you. I'm just looking to right that wrong now that I'm in a position to do so. And she was able to, you know, she did that. And when she did it, he was like, what the fuck is this? She's like, that's $10,000. So he's looking at my aunt like, what the fuck? She's like, it's not from me. He looks at my other aunt, it's not from me. He goes, it's from Jake, he knew immediately. So it's like, I say that to say this, I got my money, I ran it up, but I also took care of a lot of shit and looked back and righted a lot of wrongs. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That was a major thing. I should have never violated him like that. And I'm glad to be in a position where I'm able to fix these type of things. Definitely. We haven't spoken since then or nothing like that, but it wasn't about that. And it wasn't about the apology. It was just about the principle is I have so much respect for him now understanding that he worked for everything that he had and me being me at that time i just came and took it right you know what i'm saying yeah and i mean there's an extent to which when you're broke and you know somebody has something you you know it's wrong to take that shit. you know yeah, a lot of times you just might fuck. not care but if you're mm -hmm. really fucking broke you might do some shit that you 100 percent know goes against your fucking moral code of what's right and wrong but you do it because you're broke and now you're at the point in your life where you have the option to actually be a good person because you, you know, you, obviously you're a person who's had a, a little bit of a hard time making the distinction over the years. You've yeah. done stuff that you didn't want to do or whatever because you wanted to be able to take care of yourself. And I mean, that that is just an awesome part of it. Yeah, that's that's the thing that a lot of people don't see is they just hear me tell the stories of things that, that's the difference. I talk about shit I used to do. Mm. I'm talking about I hate, like fucking people up now. I don't, you know what I mean? I talk about everything I used to do, but that gave people an impression on me like, oh, that must be all he's about. But at the same time, I don't put out a lot of the positive shit I do in the background because I feel like a lot of people do that shit for clout. Like, oh, I want you to see me give this to this homeless guy. Right. I can take care of people behind closed doors. They're going to take care of me when I see them. It's going to be that respect. And I know I'm doing it for the right reasons. Right. No one knows about it. But the thing is, where it travels. You know, if I go hurt somebody, I'm not going to tell everybody I did it. But people are going to talk about it. So when you hear about my reputation from someone else, it's going to speak louder to you than if I was like, oh, yeah, I'm about that life. This is what I do. Right. You know, so even the good I do, it still travels around because that word still spreads. Definitely. But uh, 
making so much more money now at this point do you have plans for how you can kind of solidify yourself more like you thinking about buying a house you thinking about i don't know the hundred thousand dollar chain is a good start yeah no it ain't that's just the, <laughs> that's just the that's just the trophy just had honest. to do it it's a trophy bro yeah. it's a fucking trophy it's an accomplishment and to be honest with you i haven't spent any of the money from youtube really i've stacked all of it you know what i mean me and my family situation we straight but you that know, that's hard though. That's probably the only question of yours. <laughs> that, shit, uh, that is hard. That's <laughs> probably the only question of yours I'm not really gonna get into because anything aside from YouTube, I don't speak on. Really? I plan on getting into a whole lot of shit, but when it comes to businesses and everything like that, because you got these clout chasers out here, bro, I could buy a business. They find out I own that, they're gonna fuck with it. Yeah. They're gonna do little fucking shit because they don't wanna see you get into shit, so I don't put out none of that private shit. Mm. You're not gonna see me telling people, you know, family pictures. You'll see my daughter, that's it. I don't show people anybody. Right. I keep all that shit private. Yeah, once you get into the... Because a lot of people are willing to put their whole life out there on display because nobody gives a fuck. Once you actually get to the point where your privacy is something that you, you want to hold on to for dear life, it kind of yeah. becomes like shit. Well, I, I'll hold I on like, to the, as much of that as I can. You know, like, with uh, certain channels, Hip Hop Daily... <laughs> a motherfucker that just copies all my shit and just repeats You don't know it. anything about who that is or anything? Bro, listen, I'll put money to find out who that is. Yeah. Like, that motherfucker literally will, word for word, copy a video of mine and then repost it. And he got a whole little group. They do weird shit. Yeah, there's other channels that it seems like yeah. him, and sometimes they use a different they'll voice. Put out, they'll put out the fakest fucking thing, like, oh, this is why so-and-so got killed. It ain't got nothing to do with that, just for that clickbait. I reported them to YouTube for one. that It was something where it made it look like uh, Key Glock was saying that he knew Dolph was going to die, and it had, like, 2 million Man. views. And it was a fake quote, and I sent it to my YouTube rep, like, you got to stop letting them get away with this shit. And I don't know if actually anything really happened from that. See, I'm not going to hold you to it because you're not in no gang or nothing. I wouldn't even report somebody on Xbox for talking shit. Like, mm -hmm. I don't be on none of that. But it's just, you know, it is what the fuck it is. I just like to run into certain people. Right. And just have that conversation in person. But I think but, that that guy's kind of smart because he knows that. Well, he does it how he does it. And that's, that's the point of what I'm getting at right. is the simple fact that I got more smoke than I know about. Mm. I got people that I don't know about that want to do something to me just because of either what I spoke on, either it was a, a friend, a relative, they just want to get famous, whatever. Mm. So because my face is on shit, I got to move a certain way. Right. And that's why it's like, you view how many people I got here. We got people outside, everything. So like how Milk74 pulled up on you, I pray for his safety, he doesn't do that over here. Yeah. And he going to be on the news outside. It's just, that's, you got to move if a certain he, if way. If he had actually pulled up, like if he had actually like, attempted to do anything that situation would have played out a lot different while the, i'm here the, or not just in general like the way that he put oh, that out there as if what he did was some tough shit was like the most misleading shit ever like we, he pulled finna, up and uh, left immediately we finna go to his spot after this because you know we trying to take a picture with him i'm a big fan of milk <laughs> so i'm trying to link up with him while i'm out here right so this is like one part interview trip another part sightseeing yeah there's nobody else you want to see not really. Mm. I mean, like, <laughs> that ain't really like. <laughs> we just gonna do some tourist shit. Yeah. Hang out and then we out of here. Yeah, definitely. How many days are you here for? Just tomorrow. This is your first time in LA? First time. Fuck. First time for me, too. That's sick. That's yeah, actually dope as fuck to hear. Yeah, you we, keep saying here as if we're still in Boston. We pulled out to a, we pulled up to a, uh, some liquor store in Inglewood. And uh, it's just different, you know? Like being in the corner store in the hood, it's like y'all got different hood shirts. Like we got G-Mans. That's our like black tee, white tee in Florida. Y'all got, uh, I forget what the fuck the Remember name the fuck was. That weird yeah, y'all got different shit, shit out here, but it was just different. The prices of bottles are different in the hood. Like all that mm, shit's different, but you know, crazy. it's a cool little vibe though. We ain't renting no bullshit or nothing Who'd like that. Who'd you go to Englewood with? Us. Just you guys? We yeah. pulled up. Yeah, no, nah, it was a liquor store because the airport right there. But there's gotta be a lot of people who wanna who want you to tap in while you're out here, right? I'm sure you talk like to all who, kinds like of these people. fucking white people on YouTube that ain't got nothing to do with gangs? No, nah, but I'm talking about even like real deal gang people would probably be like pretty hyped to have you come I mean, we tap got, in. We got, we got real deal gang members from the West that stay in the East. Mm. <laughs> we got them in Florida, you know what I'm saying? All different sets, whatever, whatever. So we already have that. Mm. So it's not like a really a mission to, like when I step somewhere, bro, We'll be in the hood, whatever, whatever. But if we traveling somewhere, we trying to do some big lavish shit. 
You know, we got a mansion while we out here. We hanging the fuck out. We got a poker table in one of the rooms if you're trying to slide through later. Hmm. Yeah, we can hang the fuck out for real. So it's like, <laughs> that's the type of time we on. We, we already live this shit. So like how Pino came out here, oh, I'm gonna visit the projects. <laughs> we already in them bitches. We really do this. We right. don't just play, play, pretend, for, you know, whatever. For, and for nothing, you know, I ain't mean to interrupt, but the politics is very different out here versus over on the East Coast, you know what I'm saying? So. You know, we know that we were we were very aware of all that. So you know, we don't want to, you know, get mixed in the politics and then you know, okay, we're not dealing with them type of dudes and this and that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's a it's a different level out here. Like you got certain bloods that fuck with certain cribs. Right. You got certain bloods that don't fuck with certain bloods. So whoever you tap in with, you gotta have the understanding or the overstanding that you just inherited beef while you out here. Bro, I seen out of towners come here and link up with some bloods who are actually Crips and we're telling them they were bloods. And I mean, I can't I, <laughs> shit I can't get into on camera at all. But yeah. I see people try to tap in yeah. and get completely fucking shit misled and yeah. wild shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, shit go left. you know, blood in peace. I don't spoke on the phone with OG Red Run before he passed yeah, away. Facts. I don't mm. spoke on the phone with T Rogers. Right. Facts. You know, these are big fucking names. And uh, you know, unfortunately they're no longer here, but if it was a situation like that, we could have did that. But as far as OG Red Rum, he done pulled up to Tampa plenty of times. Right. You know what I'm saying? We got a lot of West Side homies that's down there, so it's like it's not that big on the accomplishment list for us to tap in when we already tapped the fuck in. Right. You know what I'm saying? Cause like, I mean it is kinda like that where a lot of people who are from not not from LA they want to sort of like prove that they can be accepted and no, hang no, out. No, 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 I like, understand you know? that. And I mean, yeah, it's a major move at the same time. Like, we can always pull back up and handle that, but you got to understand, like, I'm GKB. This gangster killer blood. This shit come from New York. We're not nice. a West Coast set. Mm. Shout out. We an East Coast set. You know what I'm saying? So, my, my shit come from New York. Right. You know what I mean? And it's always respect to the West. But, like, I was just in Brooklyn before this. Right. I don't know if you viewed that shit on Instagram. I was just in the Coney Island projects hanging out. You know, so. That's like our shit, you know what I mean? Right. And the whole fucking East is where we at from state to fucking state. So any state that I go to, if I'm tapping in, it's not like I'm tapping in with motherfuckers I don't know. Right. Nah, these the bros. We everywhere, you know what I mean? Definitely. That's dope, man. This guy really is one of a kind. T tell me about him. Give me man, your opinion of him. Man, listen, man, that's the bro, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, when I met him, man, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was, it, it, you know, the initial conversation was crazy, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, politics involved with, with certain things with, you know, with, with white bloods over on the East Coast, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, man, they hearing, about, hearing, hearing from other people's credentials, it's crazy. Mm. It's crazy, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's a lot more he didn't even speak about, so, you know what I'm saying? Then on top of that, I mean, he's just a, a good dude, man, great dude, you know what I'm saying? That's my brother, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, you know I'm glad, you know, he, you know, he, his success rate is where it's at, and you know, he doing good, man. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it is. You know, we, we things look that crazy because of what, of what the representation of what, you know, what we stand for and all that. But it's nothing like that. We really love our brothers, man. You know what I'm saying? We're more of a family than anything. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So we try to promote that. So forget all the negativity. You know, we don't just indulge in that. You know, we also about our family. We also about our people. You know what I'm saying? So you know, but all in all, Jake. Awesome, bro. Awesome brother. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very motivational to me, too, because I know I see so many, like, young kids who are in the streets or whatever, and, like, just to see you find such a different kind of pathway out of that shit through making YouTube videos. Like, so many people get hung up on dream of being a rapper or whatever, and for you to actually kind of, you know, being a rapper is like years and years and years for you to see any kind of success usually, and the fact that you were able to come out in the course of, like, two years, three years, and get to the point where you're making half a million off YouTube alone? That's yeah, fucking shit, ridiculous. It's, it's wild, bro, and I didn't expect none of it, and that's just, you know... Shit's just wild. Like, the only thing I've continued to stand on was just blood. Mm. You know, and for me, like, even when I got put on in the street, like, oh, like, 16, 17, when I'm officially put the fuck on, you know what I'm saying? And I didn't really understand everything. But this was just everyone <coughs> I was around. So it's like, when I went to prison, that's when shit started making sense. Because our shit different than out West. Like, we got oats and all type of different knowledge that we, we be spitting. You got to know your shit. Mm. I really got an understanding of what the shit meant and why it was made when I was in those situations. Brotherly love overriding depression and destruction, that's blood. So if me and you were in prison together, me and you were going through all this shit, COs are beating us, other people want to stab us, but we ride out together. 
I right. got your back, you got mine. When you sleep, I'm awake drinking coffee, making sure no one hits you up. We take turns. When we're in the shower, I got the knife on me. You soap up, I'm watching your back, making sure you good. You get out the shower, I pass you the knife, now I'm soaping up. We really riding out together to make sure that we either make it home or we just make it through our bed, you know what I mean? Right. It's pretty crazy, man. 1090 Jake. Um, I also wanted to just mention this. It feels like you have kind of like found your niche and you're staying in it in terms of doing this kind of content. Do you aspire to do other things with the sort of brand you're building, even like within the, the end of sentence world? Because, you know, I was thinking about it. I'm like, I don't see 1090 Jake necessarily pushing the merch so hard yet. I could imagine you hosting clubs. I could imagine you doing events. I could imagine you doing a podcast every week. There's a lot of different shit that I can imagine you sort of doing with all this, but it feels like you have been kind of slow to expand and have kind of just doubled down on this one thing that you have working for you. Yeah, I'm an introvert, bro. I like just mm. doing me. So it's like, I don't really like having to fuck with a lot of people. Right. I don't, I don't like having to, you know, I'm not opposed to anything though. And the more people I speak with on a business tip, the more I'm enlightened to how far I can take shit and make shit, you know what I mean? Right. So I got a lot of ideas going for right now. I'm sticking with what I'm doing and just at the same time, I got to get used to having this type of money. Right. It's different. That's, <laughs> that's the major thing, though, is like once you get it, the same way I learned the ins and outs on how to create a video, I have to learn the ins and outs on how to maintain what I have mm. and make it grow. Otherwise, you go right back to where you started at. Because when you start out making YouTube videos and you're just trying to pay your rent, or you just trying to, you know, you're trying to make $5,000 this month or whatever. I just want to buy weed, bro. I didn't even think <laughs> yeah. about paying rent when I started off. You know what I'm but, saying? But, but that's a certain type of grind because it's like yeah. when, when you're thinking like, I'm just trying to get enough to fucking take care of myself. Like bro, if I could, a, a if I bad, could eat this a month. Bad, I, I got to check myself sometimes, bro, because a bad month for me is if I didn't make 30000 Right. That's a bad month. And I come from a position where like, you know, making 1000 is big. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's certain people that never really seen 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 in their face, like cash. Right. So when I'm looking at my bank account now, that in itself is motivation. It just inspires me to, you know, because there's a lot of motherfuckers that's never touched that amount. And I'm also in a position to bring a lot of people up with me. Mm. And I love to be able to do that. Two of the, two of the biggest things that I want to do is one, get someone on the same page that I'm on, and two, get somebody out of prison. I want to put enough legal funds behind them to overturn that case and get them out. You know what I mean? That's like a major thing that I want to accomplish and do just to be able to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there's certain people that's literally only in there because they didn't have that lawyer money. Right. If they had that lawyer money, they would have been straight. If I had know a, lawyer, a lot of people like that. I had a lawyer, I probably never would have went to prison, to be honest with you. Really? But prison was the best thing that ever happened to me for the simple fact of how much of a learning experience it was. Like I said, my greatest learning experiences came from losses. Prison was a fucking loss. But if I never went through it, I never would have matured. I never would have been able to speak. I never would have got over that uncomfortability of moving different places or being in new environments in there. You got to stand out with your chest up. Mm. You got to speak up. You know what I'm saying? So it broke me out of my shell in a way. Do you think... Uh, uh, oh, I was going to say something. Um, and, you know, for the record, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, you know, people on his caliber of status in life, you know, when they, um, you know, on that... Most of the time, they don't really be official. You know what I'm saying? They 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 not they're not really plugged in. They're not really linked in directly with the biggers, the big homies, nothing like that. And um, with that being said, you know, a lot of them in their own type of way kind of get distorted a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So you know, with his situation, that's different. He he he, you know, he got the street cred. You know, definitely been through whatever, and he's real right. You know what I'm saying? He 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 don't gotta he don't gotta give us he 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 ain't giving he ain't giving nothing. This this whatever he do he do it. He can, I mean he round us with a hundred thousand dollar chain and he's accepted. He can come come to the hood, hundred deep, two hundred deep, and look that like ain't nobody. Hey, what you want? You know what I'm saying? It's what you want. You know what I'm saying? And you know that's the that's that's the one plus that he got that a lot of a lot of people can't say that they got because they got a lot of people around them that's. Paying, you know, not not probably literally out their pocket, but they everywhere they go. Oh man, you know, I gotta bring my bros with me, and I gotta, you know, make sure all my bros get in the club, and you know, things like that. I'm buying all the bottles and all that. It's nothing like it's that. The finessery that gets them in the, it, it gives them the uh, the image that they want. Right. Versus my whole shit literally 
was already established before the money. Right. And just the money came with it. Right. I mean, every, everybody sees the six nine scenario, exactly. and they're like, "Oh, so, so you can just be a regular guy and get popping as a rapper and then that's, join that's, the that's, okay. that's the difference between me and bros is me and whoever can get into a room, mm. and then whatever you want to test, we can test. You know, the, the, um, so six nine ain't gonna do all that. Versus, I'm a we can we, we can figure shit no, out. No, nobody really knows how important the game culture is. You know what I'm saying? Nobody, every everybody feel like um. They don't really know the importance of it, you know what I'm saying? So they don't know that these dudes got to tap in with certain people. Yeah, shit just get, uh, you got to be official, like I said, and that's why when it came to, excuse me, that's why when it came to bro, uh, not bro, but with Pino claiming that he uh, 107 Hoover, <clears throat> it, the shit got deep, right? Because I know somebody that he was actually at that prison with. So he said, you know, they had 40 Crips on the compound, and he was the head enforcer. You ever view 40 Crips on the compound in never, Florida? Never, never, never. The motherfuckers they, don't have no numbers in Florida, never. bro. And it ain't no beef with no Crips, nah, neither. Not at all. I know real Crips, certified, bout they shit, I fought with, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but the Crips will tie flags with the GDs just to have numbers. That's what they did at ACI when he was at ACI. So, you know, as much as Milk 74, <coughs> whatever, Milk be on his shit. Hmm. Pino posted a picture of his big homie, and Pino got the paperwork within the same day that his big homie, who's from Sarasota, who was already in prison before Pino was a fucking teenager, was a rat. He's doing a life sentence right now on a murder case. This is who Pino said was his big homie. Hmm. So Pino deleted it. Now he's saying his big homie is dead. A lot of fake gang members that you find, they say one of two things. My big homie's dead or my big homie's in jail and I can't get in contact with him. So he's saying his big homie is somebody named Ant. And he, I guess, got in contact with Jap5 and some of these other Hoovers out here that be on their shit. He trying to say Ant brought Hoover to Florida, right? Ant from Louisiana, they called him N.O. He got killed on that same compound that... I was at, that Pino was at, but this happened during Pino's time when I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So you telling me y'all were 40 deep on the compound, you were the head enforcer, and your big homie got smacked in a low custody dorm? The person that smacked him, the gang that that person's affiliated with, they run Pompano. So how the fuck you be hanging out and standing with the gang members that are responsible for your big homie dying? How that work? Uh, I don't know. He ain't no 107 fucking Hoover. Same reason he throwing C's up and shit. Them boys don't throw no C's up. His big homie, they got pictures of his big homie throwing C's up. Got a lot of fake ass gang members, bro. And that's mm -hmm. the difference in itself. Motherfucker ain't really trying to project all that gang shit and all that shit. It's just, it's been a part of my shit since the beginning. And it still is. So when people view it like, how come he doing all this shit and he got all this money? This was already a part of my life right. before we even got to this stage. And that's why I'm still with this shit versus other motherfuckers are trying to reach out and get official at 30 something years old. <laughs> they moving backwards. Right. So. Dude, I hear about that shit sometimes from people out here talking about dudes who are in their 30s, they're in the entertainment business or whatever, and they really want to like join gangs and catch it, bodies or, or go do drills or whatever. Yeah, like you, you want to keep it on you at the it, gun range yeah. and post a video. Yo, yes. fake cases. Okay, but people wanting to be like fake gang members, that I'm not that surprised by because I get it. It looks super cool. You want to be associated go. with it, et cetera. Fact. But the fact that someone who already kind of has figured out a way in life, who could pay their bills <laughs> off of something relatively enjoyable, have a decent <laughs> life, et cetera, and that they want to slide, it, it, that blows my mind. It don't make no sense, man. It don't it don't make no well, sense. What, what it is is Crash dummy. people... Uh, never did it so mm, because they never yeah. did it they're more willing to do it because they don't have that satisfaction and being able to say man i already did that shit mm. you know what i mean it's like getting gold teeth in florida like little pullouts all the jits get pullouts i had pullouts at one point in time right once you grow up you like you i already did it yeah For real. so motherfuckers that ain't never lived that life they want to do it now because they feel like they missing that respect that other people have for doing that shit when they were younger mm. so. yeah i mean there's kind of like two different ways that you can do it content-wise. Like I was talking to uh, Abner from 60 Days In, 
and he told me that he was trying to get on a the head Chicano. Yeah, yeah. He told me he was trying to get on uh, Gillian Wallow, and that they didn't really get back to him or something, and that basically it might have gone back to the fact that they saw him as a snitch because he was one of the a, one of them sixty days in people hit me up. I forget which one it was. It was a white guy. He said, "Hey, can we do an interview?" I never responded to him though. But do you think taking that kind of TV role is sort of snitch ish? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, because in the beginning, the sole Who fucking thing that they say yeah. is, uh, you know, your job is to go in right, and yeah. get us whatever. What could be more of get? a snitch thing than getting yeah. a bunch of people you don't even know in trouble? Yeah. I mean. But yeah. then on the other hand, you have somebody like Vlad, or even me to an extent. Like I would interview a famous snitch. Like I don't fucking care. Like Vlad has done crazy interviews well, where you learn all kinds of crazy shit with dudes or informants. Yeah, you, because it, they have you, nothing to hide. You, you know. Interview Pino, so you know that's a, that's a, that's somebody that's known for being a fake crip and a snitch. Right. So it's like. Uh, at the end of the day, bro, you you're not under game politics. Right. At the end of the fucking day, you got to understand there's a business behind everything. People want to hear his perspective too. Mm. You know who I was listening to? That's a full blown rat on YouTube. Is uh Sammy the Bull, right? The old mobster. He got a YouTube channel. Right. You listen yeah. to some of his stories. That shit's gangster. He a full blown rat. Mm. And that man done killed like 17 people on paper. Could you interview him though? Nah. If you did that, kind I wouldn't of have that conversation with no. him. Nah, I wouldn't even do it. Because at the same time, like, I'm not trying to lower my standards. How long am I going to go? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, what, what is the final point? Like, all right, I can view it as profit, but at the same time, I can stick with what I'm doing. Mm. You know? So, like, if you interviewed 6 9 I wouldn't feel no type of way, but I would pass on that interview. Right. It's just it's what it is. I mean, that's been one kind of weird thing to see is how many people in hip-hop, like, I think Vlad turned it down. Joe Budden turned it down. He never hit me up, but I'm not well, trying Vlad, to do it. Vlad, you know? Vlad uh, respected by a lot of respectable people in the streets. Mm. People try to say Vlad the police. He asked questions, bro. One thing about it, if you've had contact with the police, you don't have to answer questions. Right. So how the fuck are you going to get mad at a question if you answered it? Mm. You don't have to answer. I respectfully decline to answer that. It's as simple as that. Right. You know, so if you can't decline Vlad, you probably can't decline the police neither when they're asking you some shit. Right. It's very fucking simple. His That's job how I've is, always looked at it, his too. His job yeah. is to get the fucking information. My job, because I don't interview people, is to find your information. However mm -hmm. well hidden it may be, money makes the world go round. I hit up the state attorneys. How much is it going to cost to get a cent to me? Okay, boom. And now we got it. And, and me or Vlad, like, there's been a hundred times where somebody's done an interview and then hit me up afterwards and said, hey, can you take out that story where I talk about putting a gun in somebody's face back in the day because I got this case and that could be used in this case or whatever. Like, yeah. shit like that happens all the time. And I, I do hate when people ask me to remove shit from interviews that's just dumb shit. Like, that's fucking... why I stopped doing interviews, <laughs> yeah. bro, because people are like, yo, can you remove this? Uh, you know, come to find out they lied about this. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like... But if it's some shit that's going to get you locked up, I'm not... Yeah, of course we're gonna remove it. Nobody wants to be known. Yeah, but if you if you that. slipped up and said some shit that make you look some type of way, that's on you, bro. Right. That's your truth. Yeah. Now you want to hide it. Mm. Well, how the fuck I'm gonna remove the video? Like people ask me to take videos down all the time. Mm. I tell them if you get the news to take it down, I'll take mine down. Right. Because if they're not gonna take theirs down, you you feel like you could step to me directly yeah. because you can just hit me up on Instagram. And because the news you know is not saying? speaking to the streets, your shit clearly is like for well, the I'm people who care about that too, shit. So yeah. it's like if we finna get political, we can get political <laughs> yeah. about it. You know, I did a video on uh, Lil Paru. Oh my God! I love the fact that you embraced him. <laughs> I didn't embrace that <laughs> shit. Okay, but from my perspective, <laughs> I was at Dave and Buster's years ago, maybe three years ago, four years ago. I see Boom Gang. John Cabana, respect yeah. John Cabana. I see him. Oh, what up? How you doing? He's with some kid who got crazy face tattoos. I'm like, what up? He's like, I'm Lil Pyro. I'm thinking in my head, like, oh, word? Like, okay. Like, are you? Like, whatever. But anyway, then he hits me up. He's Somehow like, he gets you? my number. He texts me for the next fucking, like, he still will text me every couple months trying to just get an interview going. When I saw that you did a video on him, I was so happy. I'm like, finally, I actually get to fucking learn about this well, dude got, who's I been got, bothering me. So... I hit up the Island Boys because they're talking about <laughs> they uh they were saying they were sex money murder. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, you in the state of Florida, so mm. if you're gonna be that, there's a specific motherfucker you have to know. Facts. I wanted to know if he knew that specific person. He didn't. Not Chico, that guy who kidnapped him. No, nah, I'm talking about a real blood. Right. Not whoever the fuck they be around. So that's what I'm saying when this shit like it's just tapped in for real. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Everyone knows each other. Everyone can get in contact. Real deal shit. That's how you figure out who ain't what they say they is. Mm. 
What I respected about Fly Soldier is he kept it honest. He said some stupid motherfucker from Atlanta blessed them in and right. whatever, whatever. He told me he wasn't real. I respect you for telling me that. That ain't your fault that you got misled, but I'm glad we on the same page. Just stop doing the red flags and all that shit. We straight. He got me on the phone with Lil Pyru, put him on the FaceTime. Lil Pyru was like, nah, he gonna screen record it. He gonna, da, da, da. I'm like, bro, I'm not gonna do nothing. I'm in bed, bro. Like, I'm not gonna do nothing. I just wanna talk to you. Hmm. So I get him on the phone. He the type to like boot up. Like, he just wants to yell over you. I'm like, bro, just answer the simple questions. You know what I'm saying? I did the video and I said it in the video. If anything is false in this video, have your big homie get in contact with me. I'll take everything down and do another video apologizing. If you really that, of course he's not. You know, so he claiming the South Bronx, but the blood said he's claiming's out of Maryland and fucking, it's just a mess. He's someone that ain't mentally all the way there. Tattooed some shit all over his fucking face. I've got the pictures of when he was going to college, right. how he looked beforehand. Would I smack him in person as much as I would want to initially? Nah, because I understand you like really fucked in the head. <laughs> right. Like you like a sight case, you know what I mean? Now if I viewed him and he's like, oh yeah, little Pyru, I might, yeah, all right, then fuck it. But it's just like, you know, it's just clearing shit up, bro. Cause somebody like that, people will try to portray that shit with, with me. I, I tell you about my pain. Mm. I tell you about getting hit up. I tell you about how it feels to be locked up, not seeing your people. <clears throat> The fucked up side of things. That's the thing with me is like, when people were trying to mentor me on shit, you don't want to go down this path because you might go to prison and get raped. That didn't do it for me. I'm not scared of that shit. You know what I'm saying? Versus when I tell my stories, no, people are getting gutted in there. You're going to see people gurgling on their blood when they get hit in the neck and they lay in there dying and you in a cage watching them die. It's mm. fucking disgusting. You can smell the shit leaking out of their body. You know what I'm saying? When someone's getting fucked in an open bay dorm and they got a blanket, oh, you smell shit in the air. Yeesh. This is how this really is. So when you talk to a teenager like that, then they're like, oh, I don't want to be in there. Yeah, no, it's different. Mm. But when you just give them the little runaround, it doesn't do it. So when you see a little Pyru, next thing you know, you got a little Zach. Mm. And a little Zach wants to do the same shit. And then he ends up getting flipped, shot, whatever, ends up in prison because he was trying to portray some shit. But do you ever worry with your channel? Like, Do you like to have a good mix of real gangster shit and then sort of like exposing fake ass gangster shit because i mean it's if, however it comes up but at the mm. end of the day gangster shit is the key word so whether you faking it or you keeping it real but it all falls in the same category because if your whole channel was just like videos about situations mm. like the little pyru thing and the island boys it might start to look a certain way right well i mean bro y'all representing the shit that i put in pain by mm. the fuck you mean you know what i'm saying like if y'all came to prison doing that, we gonna get you. So it's different. Like, what's somebody gonna say? Oh, you made a YouTube video exposing him. That okay? We didn't open his fucking body up. Right. You know how bad of this shit could have got. Like, right. is he dead? Did he get shot? No, no one cut him. What are you complaining about? Mm. I'm doing very civilized shit right now, and I'm making money off of it. Right. I could get somebody stamped and do a video on this shit after the fact and make my money back after getting somebody stamped but i'm not doing no shit like that how do you feel about the fact when people say that your channel is just kind of like highlighting negativity and you're really just sort of profiting off of other people's pain and, and all this murder and shit like that i'm sure you've had people say that kind of shit what, what, what's your like go-to response to that fuck them <laughs> the fuck you think you think medication <laughs> for cancer is free right. is health care free no nah, they sell that shit to you as you die and if you ain't got enough money to pay for this shit, you just dying. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. well, I can't speak on this shit because of what? Oh, you not from this city. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to speak on whatever the fuck I want to. So you telling me I can only speak on my own gang, my own pain, my own losses, my own this and that. I've spoke on that. Mm. And then I speak on everything else, too. I mean, people are going to feel how they feel, bro. If I cured cancer tomorrow, they're going to say I didn't do it fast enough. My granny died 10 years ago. Fuck you. Now you want to cure it? So it's like people are gonna have opinions. I'm not here to change your opinion. I'm not here to be liked. I'm just here to do me. Whatever comes with it comes with it. How do you feel when people say that you might be like racist for the way that you're running your channel? Does that ever come up? What? <laughs> How? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel that like just that. Blew me. <laughs> I feel like that's probably something you've read in the comments. Oh, is that it's, like, it's mostly like black people that I'm covering. Right. All right. Who the fuck do you see me around? How many white people can you point out on my Instagram that I'm next to? Mm. My daughter's mixed. My girl is black. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is who I'm around. 
It's the culture you can say that a man. It's the same shit for you, bro. Motherfuckers gonna be like, oh, he don't interview enough white people. What the fuck? Right. This is the culture you tapped in with, bro. It is what the fuck it is. You know what I'm saying? So who's really mad? What I need to do a Billy Bob interview with a fucking skinhead? <laughs> And y'all hey, go feel this equal opportunity now? I mean, like, Dame Dash asked me why I don't interview, like, country singers. I was like, I don't, I don't listen to country music. I mean, bro, I've had people say <laughs> shit that ain't even in the streets themselves, and they'd be black. Right. Oh, interview your own people. Bitch, you can't even step in the areas I'm stepping, and you black. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it is what it is. People are going to hate for whatever reason. Hmm. I can't really focus on it, and the bigger I get, the less time I have to focus on it. Right. So at this point, it's just, you know... But people do pick and choose, though, even when it comes to there's people that don't fuck with me simply because I'm white. Right. And then there's people that don't fuck with me because I might have put their artist on blast, like, say cheese. Mm. I didn't know Spartum Gardam was signed to him. I blasted Spartum Gardam's paperwork. Say cheese went on an interview with somebody talking about, oh, yeah, the Internet's twisting this and that. I ain't twist nothing. I read the fucking paper. Did you? So I posted the shit on my gram. He commented on it and then deleted his whole comment. What did he say? He was just on some shit like, oh, when I grew up, I thought snitcher was me and you did a crime together, and I tell on you to save myself, right? I mean, you could twist it however you want to. I don't know where Say Cheese is from or what type of life he lived growing up or where his perspective comes from, but Spot him, got him, literally told on his homeboy and said, oh, he went in the bathroom, I think he hit a gun, and he was the last person to go in the bathroom. Police go in the bathroom, they find two guns, his homeboy goes to jail. What do you call that? If me and you were in a car together and I got a gun on me and I put the gun in the fucking glove box and I don't say nothing and you like, well, he had it, he put it in the glove box, what is that? Right. You told on me at the end of the day. I mean, I'm not going to expect a civilian to take a gun charge for me, so I'm not going to put you in that type of position around no guns if I don't feel like you're going to hold it down. But you're supposed to be spot him, got him. What the fuck does that even mean in itself? The name? You're supposed to be a gangster. All right. Oh, he, so it's like, bro, come on now. You can't be half-stepping. You can't be one foot in, one foot out. You be the gangster or you fucking tell him. You think the fans actually care about snitching at this point? Nah, this society don't even care about snitching. I do, and I make money off this shit, so I talk about it. <laughs> but nah, you could be a successful snitch if you want to. A lot of people lie. And you got to understand, there's more people that are willing to tell than anything else. Right. M like, more people, normal people, will tell on you. And then there's gangsters that will tell on you. It's a very small population of people that are actually gonna hold it down. So it's just, you know, it ain't that big of a deal, bro. You just don't do shit in front of people and you don't fuck around with certain people. When I was looking at your most popular videos, I think number one is uh, like a 16 year old kid in Philly wearing skinny jeans or whatever. And yeah. it's a fucking wild clip where he just sort of jogs down the street, shoots a motherfucker in the head, point yeah, blank range, awesome. and then just sort yeah, of jogs yeah, back off. Crazy. And it's they just like, I don't know, something about that clip when you watch it where you're just like, what the fuck is wrong with these kids these Yo, days? Because yeah. Well, Philly, Philly a whole nother breed. Yeah. The motherfuckers in Philly, like everybody that I met out of Philly, solid. Mm. And it's like, you know, there's certain cities that have a, a culture of killing. Yeah. Miami, Jacksonville, Chicago, Philly, murder rates, Detroit. It's just like Tampa. When I was growing up, you could get your ass whooped. You could fight. We'll have a hood fight, 10 on 10, whatever, mm. 15 on 15. Now, since drill came in, everybody wants to be a shooter. Everybody wants to kill. But those certain cities have always been on that type of time. Everybody know how Miami rock and West Palm Beach, you can get shot. And in Florida, we always have big shit. Mm. So it's not little handguns, nah. Motherfuckers got AKs, M16s, all type of shit. And uh, just now everybody wants to be a shooter because that's the wave with the music. Mm. Everybody wants to kill people. And you know what's funny is a lot of times I'll see rappers like who aren't terribly close to the like street content coming out and saying that it's so fucked up when lyric when people say that, you know, music is the cause of a lot of violence. And then you'll have somebody like me or you or I mean, I'm pretty sure I've heard Vlad or Academics say the same thing because we're all super close to the music and we really know what people are saying in songs and how that lines up with killings and shit. Yeah. And all of us will say without a fucking hesitation, of course, the music is encouraging the killings. Like, that's the main thing that's fueling this shit. <laughs> that's that social media. It. Man, look, you're not allowed to tell on people, but you're allowed to tell on yourself in songs. Right. You know what I'm saying? Nobody has a problem with that. If it but was, now, if, if I do a video breaking down your song, that would motherfuckers right. would look at me some type of way. Or if I were to ask a rapper, I'd be like, what about this lyric? 
I mean, they're gonna look at me like I'm a fucking oh, detective. You're a fed, you know? you're a bitch, you done said the whole fuck. You talked right. about how you did it. You know, Kane Vaughn, that's a motherfucking storyteller. He did the shit how he was supposed to go. Mm. You're not getting nobody off of that shit. But there's certain people that you know they literally tell it all and then act confused when they get caught. Right. It's just like common fucking sense. But everybody wants the image, bro. The image is is what's so deadly. Everybody wants to be viewed as that killer. Everybody wants. That's the same shit with gang banging. You got a lot of fake gang members that never did nothing for nothing. Right. But they want the reputation of what it is to be one. So that's the understanding that I have is I've witnessed the firsthand violence and how we even got the fucking reputation. Mm. GKB, our shit, we known as being aggressive. We known as 1090. We known as, you know what I'm saying? Like What's 1090 again? I mean, there's a couple of different ways you could break that bitch down, but it's more or less what's most publicly known as set tripping. Right. And what is set tripping? Running down on motherfuckers. You could be blood. If you fuck it up and you doing this weird shit or whatever, we the ones that finna handle that. Right. We're not sparing you just cause you blood. And then, you know, you could set trip on really any other gang too. But it's just like putting it on my name, I went at it with more bloods inside of prison than anyone else. We got so many fucking, like, we got so much numbers, we'll have inner beef. Right. Cause there's no one else to beef with. I had a lot of situations where motherfuckers was like, nah, ain't no white bloods. So what the fuck it is? We handle it how we handle it. You right. know, I'm not folding my shit, so I gotta get hit up. I'm hitting somebody up. To be honest with you, I hit up more bloods than anything else. I wasn't hitting up Crips left and right, Zoes left and right. I was beefing with other bloods. Mm. So that's where set tripping comes from. You know what I'm saying? That's why I put it on my shit, just like somebody I have, you know, ABK, whatever, EBK this, whatever. Anybody killer, everybody killer. That's where that came from for me. But I set itself, we be cleaning shit up. It's the cleanup crew. <laughs> That's just how that shit go. Right. Yeah. I like how you say it so that I just know you mean it. I got to. Man. Yeah, it just really sounds like it means it. <laughs> you're you're kind of new <clears throat> at the whole YouTube thing, but you're also kind of feeling like an OG when it comes to like your particular section of YouTube at this point. Yeah. How do you feel about seeing the whole community unfolding? Obviously, we have unscrupulous uh, individuals like Hip Hop Daily, et cetera, Insider Hotspot, who really have no journalistic ethics in a field where, you know, not like that's really something that gets discussed amongst YouTubers that much. But the, I mean, that dude is like capable of the scummiest shit imaginable. And he doesn't just do it to you because he's ripped off entire Swamp Stories videos, et cetera. Yeah, I feel like it's just like on some shit, like, uh, just gotta keep pushing. Yeah. No, you can't really let it fuck you up. What blew my mind was it wasn't that he was just copying my content. He was copying my content. And he was bigger than me. Right. I'm about to hit 700,000 subscribers. That man's already at a million. So it's like, kind of made me feel good. Like, damn, you riding my wave. You making the same thumbnails as me now. Mm. My shit's hitting. And one thing about it that you can never copy is you can never be me. You can never have my face. You can never have my opinion. You can't, you know, you can word for word all the script and shit. But that's why I've always included me in my videos too, so that there's that factor of people that come for me mm. to hear my opinion, to hear my, you know, they actually like me as a YouTuber. That's why I'd be appreciating the fuck out of the fans and the subscribers and everybody. I think it was, I was getting ready to do a lavish D interview. So I'm sitting on my computer for a nice long study session to get ready for the day. And I watched a whole lavish Vlad interview. And then I watched a whole Mozzie interview and then I watched a random Hip Hop Daily video and it was so obvious that they had just watched those two interviews and just taken notes and like completely based it on that yeah. 100%. And I was just like, like, what the fuck? Well, that's the thing too is um, Hip Hop Daily, like I've shot back. Like there might be something he covered and I'll cover the same thing. Mm. But it's like, homie, I get the real information. So I'm picking up on a lot of shit you left out or vice versa. Mm. No, he'll come to my shit because he know I got certain of it. Like, that, that's how I really got him in the first video. He did a video on somebody from Florida. I was the only one that had that information because it only came from the paperwork that nobody had. Mm. And he copied that. And that's how I knew, like, you're word for word taking my shit. Right. Because you're bringing shit that I know you didn't go as far to get. You know? But it is what it is. Yeah. Is there anybody that stands out to you on the YouTube world, like, that does content that's you know about their specific scene or about anything in particular that stands out to you like i like the way they're doing shit um i mean as far as me like my biggest things that i watch i watch you i watch vice 
Uh, and then sometimes I get in the shit that has nothing to do with the style of content I do. Like mm. that's theory. What's they, up? They go around just doing all type of crazy shit, traveling to different places, helping people out. Mm. Um, there's a uh, there's someone I just started watching. He's out here in L.A. He was tapping into like the Chicano lowrider culture. Oh, that guy. I like I like the travel stuff. I like the seeing different cultures and the different foods and mm. the different things. Like I'm not really always trying to hear about some gang gang shit because I'm already in that shit, you know. Right. So it's not like for people that ain't in it, they fucking interested in it because it's something like they've never heard of and never lived. Versus me, that shit get old as fuck, mm. you know. So I like really just watching shit that ain't got nothing to do with what I'm into. But as far as people that I'm fucking with, it's really just that. Like I can't really like name anybody. Like, oh, yeah, this specific YouTube would be doing their thing. Right. You're more like expanding your mind when you're not working on your own content. Yeah. I'm not really watching that same type of shit because mm -hmm. I'm already so much in it. Yeah. Does it ever get repetitive or like how do you keep it interesting for yourself when I'm sure there's been times where you're covering a story and you're like, God damn, this is the same exact fucking story that I've covered 50 other times about some kid killing a bunch yeah, of other kids. I, and I become more selective mm. in how much of a story I can bring out of it. So sometimes I'll focus less on the crime and I'll focus more on the person. Mm. And, you know, kind of do like a little autobiography with it. You know what I mean? Where I'm really giving you the life story of this person and obviously the crime that led to <laughs> their demise. So it's just I got to be selective in the type of shit that I push. Yeah, what's the furthest you've ever gone to get details for a story? You hopping on the phone with random people you meet on Instagram that are close to the situation? That you I mean, bro, I'll, I'll fucking find out everybody that's involved in a situation. I always reach out to the family because mm. I always include the GoFundMe for the family mm. like for the victims and shit. I always like to include that GoFundMe, just one little simple step that I take that a lot of people don't. Just so it's like I can at least bring uh, attention. Right. So the cause, you know, a little girl gets killed in a drive-by, have that go find me, whatever, whatever. But, um, I mean, as far as information, yeah, I'll just reach out to the family or whatever, and then I'll just go through the court sites. To be honest with you, getting this shit for you today was the most I ever reached out. I had to contact the state attorney's office, pay a fucking fee for them to get it. They send it to another motherfucker. Like, and this is the reason I'm able to get it. Like, he broke. I know that. We know that. So he ain't going to be able to get this because he don't have no $400 to spare. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But when you want to actually pull a whole case file, shit costs money. You have to get in contact with people and know how to do it. And when people try to say, oh, I didn't snitch. I can prove it. They don't even know how to do this. So how are you going to prove it? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But... The majority of shit that I get, it's free to access. You don't have to pay anything. Right. If it's like Georgia, you got to pay like a dollar for the paperwork, bro. Right. And then you just make a couple thousand off the video. But you care a lot about being factually correct. Because that's is, all I have to stand on. There's a lot of people in the YouTube community at this point that are very happy to just put whatever the fuck out there. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I feel like is the major separator for me. Mm. That's what I can stand on is, you know, if it came from me, there's a document that I can pull up that has what I said. Mm. And You know, it's just, it's finding the simple ways of doing a lot of the same things a lot of other people are doing, but doing it your way that makes you stand out. There's some shit that happens like, you know, for instance, Young Dolph dies and like, uh, I believe you did a video about it and stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, there's people like us who are really only going to report for the most part on the stuff that the cops are reporting or that journalists are putting out, et cetera. But then there becomes this whole sort of little universe on YouTube of people trying to basically put every rumor, every social, social media, you know, idea that's floating around. They're talking to people in the streets. And a lot of times the information that they're putting out there sort of aligns itself with the truth at some point you end up figuring out that maybe they floated 10 different theories of who the shooter might have been and then it ends up that one of them ends up being correct mm -hmm. do you pay attention to that shit or do yeah, you i'd be if, you know? if i know it ain't obvious bullshit i'll address rumors but i will address them as that you know there's a rumor circulating that this happened and this might have happened mm. but i also i like to kill the rumors myself and clarify on what actually it was instead of just running off with whatever's going to get the most views, you know what I mean? Mm, definitely. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's kind of crazy to me. Like, academics, back in the day with the Warren Chirac thing, I think he was, like, the first YouTuber to get big off of really just covering street shit. Yeah, and but the it, thing it, that I didn't like about him, bro, is how disrespectful he was with it. And I think that that, looking back at it, that's the thing that he regrets. Because I, I, I had that conversation with him on his podcast where I said, not only do I think that the Warren Chirac 
was fine that it existed. Like, I think the tone he took at times was kind of disrespectful, and he's learned from that. But yeah. I think that's the work that the local journalists should have been doing. It was like, actually, if there was shit in the newspaper or on the local news about what these rivalries were all about, I mean, that's actually, like, valuable information to the community, except it takes a lot of fucking energy for journalists to find out that shit to, no, a lot I of mean, these youtubers like you are doing the stuff that journalists should be doing that local yeah, news has kind of been killed like, academics well i respect to him like i don't got nothing against him it's just like his uh satire comedy mm. it's like you know you really speaking on people that are dying and getting killed and shit and it's like that'll make somebody want to do something to you you know and uh but as far as like him getting all the information and everything like that, like that's a major step in the YouTube. Mm. So respect to him, but for the motherfuckers that are willing to look into that shit, I just feel like you deserve what comes with it. Like as far as the success, cause you really putting in that work. It's not as simple as I'm just reacting to someone else talking about it. And even if you a reaction channel, cool. I'm just saying for me, it's a lot of fucking work that I don't think a lot of people realize, you know? So it's very satisfying to actually be getting something off of that. I feel like your channel was kind of like, one, you were one of the lead people who sort of realized like, oh, you don't have to be talking about rappers. You just have to be talking about interesting shit that's happening in the streets and yeah, people and flock to it. After the fight with Pino, I realized how bad beefing on YouTube is. A lot of people be thinking, oh, that's a quick way to blow up. And it, it somewhat is, but as fast as they come, they leave because there's nothing substantial about you mm. except for the fact that you have to keep talking about people. And eventually it's gonna come back to you, you know? So with that situation, when people heard what they heard, whatever, whatever, really what solidified it, bro, was when y'all did that interview. Mm. You asked him, did he use a weapon? What did he say to you? Did he dance around it or did he just say yes? I can't remember. I'm gonna have to touch back on it, but <laughs> in the comment section, if I'm ever having a bad day, I'll go back to your, your interview with him. I just look in the comment section. Everybody is showing love. Really? Boy, I respect him. He's standing out there on his shit. He ain't got nothing on him. He willing to mad love, you know? But once I stopped, because after that point, there was nothing to talk about, you know? He wanted me to, oh, yeah, come slide on me. Come, because that's going to keep him going. Right. Same thing with K-Frog. I ended up getting into it with K-Frog because he allegedly called 911 on somebody. It was really some fluke-ass paperwork, but it's the simple fact that if I'm going to do it to Pino, I got to do it to you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I can't pick faces. And uh, so they making posts, talking shit, dissing me, but I'm not responding to none of it. Versus beforehand, my pride, I'm, I'm on all that. Yo, fuck me, fuck you. Once I stopped talking to people, their views started dying. Mm. Everything about them started dying. And now we're left with what is left. Is there anything substantial about them? Are they doing anything? k Frog still, who, he do his ones and twos, but his shit ain't doing nothing. And then Pino is pretty much just non-existent. It's wild when you realize that you don't have to respond. Yeah. Kind of changes everything. And how much power is actually in the response. Yeah. It's a pride thing. That's why I said pride is a downfall of a lot of people. I'm keeping it alive by responding to you. Mm. If I don't speak on it, you die out just as fast as everything you're talking about. 100%. Uh, what's your overall opinion of, you know, the streets and all of the shit you see going on where we see in New York and Chicago, it's all about the switches and there's just this crazy, like, new level of violence that's sort of been ushered in. What's your perspective I, I on that? I don't that? feel like it's a new level of violence. I feel like it's always been like that. The switches is just a fad, mm. you know? Uh, it went from switches. Before that, it was Glocks. Before that, it was Dracos. Before that, it was Max. It's just certain guns that make its way into hip hop that everybody wants to have. The 90s was Tech Nines. You know what I mean? Like, there's always been a certain gun for every generation. Mm. 80s movies was the fucking Berettas. You see them in the movies. Now you want one, whatever. So, you know, I feel like now it's just cool to have a switch. And motherfuckers don't even realize having that little piece of metal is like a machine eight gun years charge. Or some shit. I think it's like 10 or something. Wow. But it's literally just getting caught with the piece is you're getting charged with a machine gun. Right. It's just cool to have it. Now, yeah, you go and blaze fucking 15 people at one time. You causing damage, but motherfuckers can do that with a regular gun. Mm. You don't need a switch to hit up all them people. You know, so I feel like the violence is the same. It's just it's cooler because that's what the music is on. That's right. what the drill is on. 
mean, as YouTubers, I cover that shit. Motherfuckers is in tune with it. People love the lifestyle that they don't have to live. And that's what's fucked up about it, is a lot of young ass kids that's in that environment realize how many fans they can get by living it. And everybody that loves everything about you has never been anywhere near any of that shit that's going on. Mm. They live in the suburbs comfortably. You gotta live in that neighborhood where you just kill somebody two streets down. And now they're hitting your house up where your family members are at. And you're trying to do this to get the family out the hood. You wanna rap, whatever. But you're gonna suffer losses that come with that lifestyle. Mm. <laughs> it's a wild time to be alive, yeah. Yeah, the the music is like more, like street music is more popular than ever. And it feels like we yeah. just are kind of seeing that play out over and over. Yeah, and I mean, bro, even if you took the music out, it's just the inner city culture, bro. Yeah. You got a whole bunch of poor people in one place. A lot of people are mad at the fucking world. There's a lot of mental health shit that's not getting addressed. There's a lot of just not having resources. And shit's been like this forever. This is literally how shit was designed. It's just like the prison system. I did a video on the history of Florida State prisons. It's one of my least viewed videos. The amount of shit that I was able to learn, though I loved it, I didn't make really any money off of it. Mm. But the simple fact that I learned Florida State Prison only started after slavery ended. There weren't prisons when there was slavery. Really? They ended slavery, that's when they started putting prisons. So it literally just transferred into another thing. And a lot of Southern prisons are known for making you work, work camps. You know what I mean? It's right. the same shit. Obviously, you got to commit a crime to end up there. It's a lot of people that didn't even do the crime and still end up there. So, you know, the streets are set up the way they're set up. People benefit off of people staying poor. Mm. And it's just a part that comes with it. <clears throat> That's facts. Um, do you think that you're, you're going to be able to break a Boston hip-hop artist as a result of your channel? I'm not tapped into Boston anything. But you don't give a fuck about that? It's not that I don't give a fuck. It's that I'm not tapping in with some shit where I stay at. Mm. I moved there for a simple reason. The simple reason was to not be involved in everything. Really? You know what I'm saying? Like, See? my family and shit is separated from everything I do in the streets, the homies. I don't bring my daughter around members. Right. I separate that lifestyle because I was doing this before her. This isn't something that I want to introduce her to. I don't feel more valid by bringing my daughter into that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I don't, I personally don't do that. I don't really tap in with Boston because I don't want to be dealing with that shit in Boston. We came out here with the numbers that we came out with to make sure everything runs fucking smoothly. When I'm down in Florida, wherever I'm at, I'm good, super good. And mm. this ain't no paid security. These the homies, you facts. know what I'm saying? Big facts. But my situation in Boston, where I lay my head at, I'm not in a neighborhood I have to worry about nothing. That's how I want to keep shit. I don't want to start tapping in the streets because when you pick your friends, you pick your enemies. Mm. You're going to inherit whatever they come with. I'm not willing to do that where I live at. Definitely. Could you see yourself having more of a role in music overall, though? I can I mean, yeah, see him I, with I, some I, artists. He got yeah. a rapper chain. He a rapper. He got a rapper yeah, chain. That's, that's a real rapper chain, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've, rapper. I've been around a lot. I've been around a lot of rappers. I've seen a lot of rapper chains, and that's up there for sure. That shit is hard. Yeah, big shout out to Maz in New York, but yeah, got the Emerald Cuss and all that. But yeah. um. I like music. I appreciate music. I could definitely fuck with doing some stuff in the music industry. I myself wouldn't want to be a rapper. Yeah. Because I'm just not good at it. I'm be honest. <laughs> you, with you tried? What? Th yeah. That's why I got this fucking tattoo in my face. I was 18. I said, "Fuck it. I don't want a job. I'm gonna get this so I can't get a job, and I'm gonna be a rapper." This should say "Dream" in either Chinese or Japanese. I forget which one. <laughs> and it was supposed to be "Keep your dreams in sight." And yeah, within. I don't know. I got that. I turned 18. By 19, I realized I'm not going to be a rapper. Right. And fucking, so, you know, I never aimed to be a YouTuber either. Right. Just, you still getting tattoos? Happened. Yeah, I haven't had one in a minute, though. Mm. A lot of the shit that I got, like a lot of this was prison and in the streets or whatever. My most recent, I got, I don't even know which one was my most recent. I think it was my arm, this big ass Buzz Lightyear shit. What made you go with the Grand Theft Auto hand tattoo? I was a huge fan of the game, and that's how I felt like I was living. Mm. And uh, there was some kid in the dorm. He looked like he had some weird charges, so we used to just take all of his shit. Um, and more or less, he got a gaming magazine, and it had the Grand Theft Auto logo. So my homie Bebo, he uh, free Bebo, he doing 25 right now for a murder. He down there cut somebody's head off. 
Whoa. Yeah, he caught a sex offender that was selling dope. He only had like two or three inches of skin attached. He removed all that shit. He got 25 years for that shit. He did the tattoo and he told me the story about it as he was doing the tattoo. I didn't know. I just knew he had mad times. He's like, yeah, I was hitting him up in the neck and da da da. I'm just like, yeah, all right, hurry up with this shit. <laughs> but this is the bro though, you know what right, I mean? Right. But it's just like, I kill it, but this was also, it was also like my last TOH. Because mm. I'm in the cell with the homies as I'm getting it. This was my most painful tattoo. When they got down to the fingernails and shit, fucking hurt. I ain't gonna lie, I wanted to cry, but I'm in prison in a cell with the homies. I can't, you know what I mean? I gotta just eat this shit. Right. But Grand Theft Auto, I just felt like that's how I was living at the time, and I went and got the tattoo. You know, I got trigger happy, but at the same time, trigger finger. It could be the Xbox trigger. We're not talking about guns anymore. <laughs> I can't touch guns. I'm a convicted you felon. You can't, huh? Nah, fuck no. That hurt, just knowing that you're not allowed to? Yeah, it breaks my heart, bro, because mm. I wanted to be the one to teach my daughter about guns and shit. Like, if they told me right now, you pay a quarter million, we'll take away your, your felonies, mm. i do it. I'll drop that bag. I mean, so, if Kodak got a pardon, why not 1090 Jig? Yeah, I mean, I Biden, don't know. Biden ain't doing shit for nobody. I don't think Biden's going to be the one that looks out, though, so we might have to get He's somebody He's going to pardon a bunch office. of fucking Antifa people and shit. He ain't pardoning yeah, you. I don't know, but shout out to uh, Kodak and shout out to Trump for making that I'm, happen. I'm trying to tell you, man. Shout out to Trump, man. We'll look back at that as a great moment in our in our history of, as a country. Yeah, that was major. Yeah. I think it was him and Wayne. Yeah, right? Lil Wayne, yeah. Mm. Who's, who's the king of Florida right now? The king of Florida? Yeah, rap-wise. Is it Kodak? Um, it's got to be, right? I mean, in my opinion, it's, I wouldn't even say king because it's like, you know, different cities be on different shit. Mm. But as far as like the biggest rapper that everybody fucking with, Kodak. It's Ratchet. It's gotta it's gotta be. He's Ra Ratchet. Ratchet. Yeah. Ratchet. Yeah. Ratchet, is the, Ratchet is the king of Florida. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Ratchet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the king of Florida, man. But Kodak definitely put on, though, for Florida, 100%. Kodak, because you got to think before him, it was like there wasn't nothing for so long. And then he really kicked the door in. And then now there's a shitload of Florida artists that are coming out. Right. So it'll be motherfuckers in Orlando, motherfuckers in Tampa, Broward County, Miami. Uh, teeth, like, the hair. That's all they doing in Florida right now. Uh, like he he really kicked that door in mm -hmm. for a lot of other people. So he always got to get that respect from Florida, you know. He, ca he kind of set the template for a whole fucking generation of rappers yeah. that came after him out of there, yeah. you know. Some more literally than others because the, there's yeah. some who are kind of like Kodak clones. Let's be real. And so. oh, Jacksonville, <laughs> Jacksonville popped off of. with a whole nother. Yeah, you know they like a baby Chicago right now. Now that we're a little bit removed from the height of that beef, what's your perspective on the whole Jacksonville thing and all that shit? As far as who's beef? Uh, the the Julio Fulio uh, Young and Ace. Ace thing and everything like that. Like, what 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 are your thoughts on that? I was kind of amazed when I realized that they both don't live there. I mean, I just feel like killing is killing. Like when I was in Jacksonville, I mean, not in Jacksonville. When I was in prison, every jit I met from Jacksonville had ten years of better. Better. For that real. is a city where killing is the culture. Still the motherfuckers been on that. So for people to be like, oh yeah, they was inspired by Chicago. They copying Chicago. Them boys been smacking shit. They just like the music. And now they doing the music like that. Mm. So as far as like Julio Fulio, I don't actually spoke to him. Shout out to bruh. Uh, we done chopped it up a few times. But I mean, I don't got no sides in it. I don't got no favoritism in it. I'm actually in contact with Queso's <coughs> lawyer. Really? Queso's lawyer was the one that taught me how to get the paperwork. Really? Yeah, so I got a lot of people's attorneys and shit that hit me up like, hey, yo, when you do your next video, I want you to include this piece. This is what we're fighting for. This is a major part of the... Because people can spin a story to sound how it sounds. A lot of people mm. talk about everything against Melly. A lot of people don't talk about the shit Melly got going good. Really? A lot of people don't talk about how there ain't no murder weapons. A lot of people don't talk about how there ain't no actual fucking, like, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So you're able to spin shit how you want to spin shit. And a lot of these rappers' attorneys will hit me up like, yo, this is the update on what's going on with him. Right. You know, when Queso got slammed in the jail, I got sent the video first. Mm. I just didn't post it. Really? Why yeah. didn't you post it? I didn't post it because I don't want my Instagram to get taken mm. down. I got to have a dummy account if I'm going to show somebody getting slammed. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to really just keep that shit steady. But I knew of what happened. Right. And I couldn't post it on YouTube either because then they just demonetize the shit or whatever. Right. But you'll talk about it. Yeah, I can speak on it. things yeah. though. But that wasn't enough for me to really speak on. It was just him getting slammed. I got to give a whole story. What's your workflow look like? Like, do you have a bunch of videos that are sort of like halfway done at any given time? Or is it like nah. you wake up in the morning, you pick a topic and you just start writing um, and researching? It, it's usually that. Like, I'll drop one video and then it's like a shock smelling blood in the water. Like, I'll just be hungry. 
I might drop videos for the next 10 days straight and then mm -hmm. I might take off two weeks. Right. You know, so it's really fucking sporadic, but I'm blessed to be in a position where I got my daughter 25 eight. Really? Whenever I wanna hang out with her, we hanging the fuck out. Whenever I wanna work, I can work. Whenever I don't wanna work, I ain't finna work. Mm. You know, and uh, gives me a lot of time to do a lot of shit that a lot of people don't have the same opportunity to do as far as just being with my kid all the fucking time. Mm. You know, and that was a major thing with COVID too. Like I've literally been next to her her whole life. Only time she's not been next to me is if I'm on a trip somewhere. You had a kid right at the beginning of COVID? Uh, I had her in 2017. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So I had her, when I plead out the probation is, uh, yo, when I pled out the probation, my girl was still pregnant. Right. So that was one of the main reasons I pled out instead of fighting the case. Mm. So I can certify, get probation, get a job. This is going to force me to be a normal person, work, and, you know, be here for the birth. Right. You know what I mean? But going through COVID, just staying at home, working from home, I'm always with her. So our relationship, our bond is super tight. Yeah, and doing what you do, COVID was probably kind of perfect for that since it's yeah, just going to keep home. you home to work, so really. So that yeah. shit obviously was booming and fucking everybody's tuned into YouTube, but yeah. it never declined neither. So obviously, like, with everything that's going on and everything opened back up, the channel still continues to do better and better. Mm. Yeah, like how do you stay motivated? Because sometimes you get to the point as a YouTuber where you made a shitload of money and you look at the bank account and the bank account's looking pretty good. And it's like, am I going to work my ass off all day to make this video, make a couple thousand bucks? I mean, shit, like it's, it's definitely the best use of my time, but also it's not really changing anything for you. I'm sure you kind of go through that in your head. Well, I stay motivated off the fact that I got like three homies right now fighting murders. Mm. I got one homie that just played out the manslaughter, got hit with 15. I got another homie fighting a mandatory life sentence from a home invasion. I'm not so successful to the point that I'm not still tapped in with the pain mm. and with the with the downside of the street shit, you know? So I hear about homie just got locked up for this. I'm around certain people, you know what I'm saying? When you have success and it's by yourself, you can forget where you came from. I'm still very tapped in with where the fuck I came from. So I still have that in my mind. But like motivation though, I used to just keep $10,000. If I didn't feel like doing a video, I'd go count that bitch. By the time I'm done counting, I'm like, yeah, let's do this video. <laughs> you know, cause just to be able to just pull out 10,000 and just count that shit like that. Now I'm just look at this chain. Just pick that bitch up, put it in the light. Yeah, let's do this video. You know what I mean? Do a couple videos, get another chain. Huh? You could do a couple of videos, get another chain. Yeah, that's the thing, is it just pays itself right the fuck back. Like, it's like, all right, boom, I drop this on that. Let me just do a good, you know, right. bang it out this month, and then I just got all my money back. Right. So it's, that's the motivation. Definitely. What's the most important shit to you in terms of how you raise your, your daughter? Like, what's the most important shit that you're trying to instill in her or that you want her to have in her life that you didn't have? I want her to be happy. And I wanted to understand I'm always with her. You know what I'm saying? I always got her side, her back. I'm not going nowhere. Cause that's the main things that I didn't have. But I got a lot of that through my aunt. So my aunt was there to pick up the pieces for a lot of things. So I'm very close to my aunt. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it's just, I don't, I want her to understand everything. She's gonna know who I am. She's gonna know the type of life that I live. I'm not gonna hide anything from her. I'm gonna be the one who expose her to shit and show her this is what it is. It was me being interested in certain things that got me in certain positions. You know what I mean? So I just want to really be able to instill a lot of the the things that I've learned along the way. And then, you know, she's already good. Mm. You know, she's financially straight already. I don't want her to know that. It's not like I, I want to raise her in Beverly fucking Hills. No, I want her to be around everybody the same way I was. I want you to respect poverty. I want you to respect the differences in people's lives and have that understanding. My kid was born in Beverly Hills. Yeah, that's a blessing. <laughs> that's what's up? That's, that's just where the hospital was. That's what's up. <laughs> nah, man, that's what's up. Either way, yeah. that's what's up. It's just little shit like that, you know? Yeah. Because there's going to be a lot of things that she's not, she, she ain't going to have to learn it the hard way. Mm. I had to learn it all that way just for me to understand it. Right. So it's just being able to you know, tell her that. Every once in a while I interview somebody or I'm watching another interview and uh, 
they'll ask about their childhood and the person just says like yeah you know my childhood was pretty good like i had good parents and you know like they took good care of me i had i had a good support system around me and that shit always stands out to me a lot because not that many people say that but that's like yeah. the best gift that you could give your kid yeah. is a nice normal fucking upbringing yeah, without no any significant trauma you know well a lot of people it's a beautiful too, thing people feel like it fucks with people's credibility because yeah. they were trying to say one of the uh, rappers from chicago went to a private school right and they try to dub his whole career off of that right like bro when I started tapping in the, the Orlando drill scene, mm -hmm. I was surprised how many of them dudes that done got killed or arrested for killing graduated high school and were like athletes. And just, you know, once they got out of high school, they ain't had nothing to do, they got into the streets. Mm -hmm. For me, I had dropped out and everything. Like I went to juvie and then I couldn't go back to school. So I was going to a school that you could only get into if you've been in juvie. Mm -hmm. So everyone I was in juvie with went in the same class. We gotta get padded down metal detector all that shit just to get to the class you know so i was surprised hearing like damn these grade a motherfuckers just turned into assassins in a matter of like 12 months right but that's literally you know you got people that come from happy homes that still want to get into some shit yeah that's some wild shit that people would look down on somebody that much for the fact that you know when i hear that they went to private school it probably to me means their family was relatively responsible with money and were able to put money aside to prioritize their education which is a great thing mm -hmm. although it does definitely make you wonder then why did you become a you, fucking you know, savage you know who you can usually tell got a bag bro like you got nice teeth mm. see that's that's the next thing i'm trying to get like bro <laughs> i'm trying to get my shit hit up i gotta mm. get the veneers like ad how ad got his shit <laughs> that's all i'm trying to get because that shit just changes the dynamic of a lot of shit yeah but if you go to jail with some nice teeth, motherfuckers gonna think you either the police or you just came from a good home. Right. Because that's literally like braces as a kid, that's major. That your, shit is expensive, your yeah. people have money. Mm -hmm. Or you just had some good ass insurance or whatever it was, but like, that's another little thing that you pick up on. But it is crazy how having a, a nice set of teeth just makes you look so much more sophisticated or with it. And like, if you see somebody with really bad teeth, it's weird how your brain kind of like thinks like, Oh, that they, they might be like a drug addict. So no, that's, that's like they I, might be a meth addict. That's why, Even though that's yeah, kind of yeah, fucked yeah, up. You could just have bad teeth. That's the first thing somebody gonna think. Yeah, yeah, straight up. It's, it's weird, it's but your brain is. kind of mm -hmm. does that for you. That's a fact. Well, I mean, for number one, it's your poor hygiene. So you know, yeah. I mean, but, <laughs> but it's like most of the development of your teeth happens when you're so young that it's like it's not really your but, fucking. But when are you? When are you gonna get the homie C Mac shit fixed? He got There's a lot shit. of work to do there. <laughs> <laughs> when I met him, they weren't so bad, but then all of a sudden he's got the big ass. Yeah. But he's about to go back in. Yeah. He told me. So uh that shit done, Yo, man. that dude, man, like, hey, free like we got yeah, for real, free him, bro. Like we got respect for bro, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like he funny as hell, bro. Like yeah, for he's real. He's staying on business. It's like when you look at somebody like him, first and foremost, I think he's like funny. Yeah. Like, his personality and shit. He's funny as fuck, bro. But for him, that's really him. Mm. That's his life. And what? it's like you could respect that shit because it's like homie be standing on his shit when it came to whatever. He owned that. But at the same time, it's like if he don't have the right people in his ear, bro, that shit can go left quick. And I feel like a There's lot been a of lot people, of changes in his uh, clique over the past couple bro, of weeks. I feel like a lot of people are just waiting on his downfall, bro. Mm. As sad as it is to say. One thing he really I talks what? like that in person. Like, yeah. yeah, it doesn't get turned off. Oh, that's yeah. that's, One thing I respect yeah. about him, man, like he keep it, he, he like, you know what I'm saying? Like he really look out for for the you know he really care you know what i'm saying like he ain't he ain't really worrying about the money like that he just really like really for the people you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so and and, and we, when it come to this culture you know what i'm saying whether you be whatever whatever <laughs> whatever you is you know the game culture like i say it's always looked that different so for somebody to turn that around no, no matter what you <laughs> is and make turn it into a positive and give people a different outlook on the whole thing i respect that all day you know what i'm saying because like the yeah. the dp like some people are trying to act like the dp was going to fuck his career up nah. i'm like nah that no. bro, that I, proves I, I, that he I, is I, who he says I he is more than fact, anything. Man, we I got knew for a fact after that shit happened. It. Yeah, it was going because it's like same shit that happened with me. You either gonna you jump me or you use something on me. It's gonna make you look bad. It ain't gonna make me look bad. Mm. They had a, they. I mean, they did what they did because that's how they're supposed to do it. But you got a few motherfuckers that's gonna laugh at you know. Oh, you got this. You got that. And then the majority, they're going to respect you for standing mm -hmm. on your shit. Because it just goes to show, bro, if you're willing to go against that with your own people, you're willing to go against that if you get caught by yourself with another group, you know? 
But just for him specifically, like, be fucking with his shit. He actually subscribes to my shit too. Really? Yeah, I checked that That's shit dope. not too long ago just to see who was on it because his subscribers don't went up. Yeah, yeah. So he's up there. So shout out to him. Yeah, because he can't keep an Instagram. So he just doubled down on YouTube and <laughs> making you know, good money off that shit. You know, shit. another thing that I like about Brodo is, is like you said, it shows the authenticity and who he is. Milk ain't going to get a DP like that. Mm. He Hell don't no. be with nobody. When's the last time you seen, like all these Hoovers that's talking about him, I ain't never met him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we fought with him. Yeah, you fought with him reposting your shit. I understand the game. Right. If he wasn't reposting your shit, you wouldn't talk about him. You to know? get a DP, you got to be somewhere in tune. So, so let's look facts. at the let's look that's at the like, that's a fact. Let's look at the Pino situation. That man came to California with a registered sex offender. <laughs> Why he ain't getting a DP? So this is a major fucking thing right here. I can't wait for you to repost this shit on the clips. Shout out to No Jumper <laughs> Clips, by the way. Hey, subscribe. Hey. Hey. So uh, another thing about that is the only time Pino was ever seen with other Hoovers is when he went over to K-Frog's hood and gave K-Frog's homies bandanas. So all the K-Frog and his homies put on orange bandanas because Pino went and bought about 10 of them bitches. Mm. And Pino did a video. Yeah, who said I can't come over here? I'm good over here. Duh. It's the only time you've ever seen shit. him standing next to somebody claiming Hoover and come to find out it was K-Frog and mm -hmm. K-Frog's homies. Come on now. That's the only one you can get next to. And then you got this big fucking MMA sex offender that you rode around L.A. with. Get the fuck out of here. It's just crazy. It's a wild world. It's crazy. Motherfuckers want to be gang gang so bad that when you're really in this shit, you really just want to don't even mention the shit because you know how fucking... You know, this shit get used against you. If, if you want to do a podcast with Crip Mag, you can just use the studio. That would be Bro, we hang the fuck out. <laughs> See, the thing You're is... You're leaving, though. How he, Yo, how he talks is how I talked when I first went to prison. Mm. But taking out all the C's in my vocabulary, you when we hitting the band team. You stopped doing that? Yeah, I stopped because it was fucking retarded. <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> I mean, you're making the YouTube videos. It's going to look kind of unprofessional, right? Anybody wants to fucking hit me, like, I already, like, when I read, bro, that's really when that Boston shit comes out. Mm. And he parked over here, and he fucking, when I'm talking, it's really like, I got to get pissed off and that shit to really be hitting. Because right. I use a lot of Florida slang when mm. I'm talking, too. But you know how fucking exhausting it was to talk like that? The first <laughs> five I felt, seconds? I, I had to, because I was in the dorm with a crit from Orlando. Shout out to Flex. Right. That's how he talk so it's like when we when we got to count off you know instead of saying five he'll say jive instead of saying six i'll say bix we'll be standing right next to each other and sounding off like that right you know what i mean that's just so it's just like you kind of competing with them like all right you finna do it i'm finna do it that, <laughs> that's the most amazing thing about crit mac is it's the the c's instead of b's is cool but the fact that he is able to say five instead of like two or four or he be one snapping, bro. that is amazing and he, he, he barely be slows it, down he, and he, he, he said he be keeping it nifty on 50s, 50s yeah yeah. 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 yeah yeah bro that's we just fought, we fought with yeah. C. if that, c mac ever want to come down to florida that's a fact that's a fact you listen man listen Right up in Tampa, he, he, he gonna be super straight. He got his own slogan and everything. Yeah, <laughs> but I like the commitment to the big booty sitches. Yeah, because yeah, like yeah. six six suity sitches, that just sounds stupid. Bro, man. listen, that man's at, at the same time, crazy. I understand he be on that boxing shit. You know, mm. we got some homies that's his size. We got some we got some football players in this bitch. Yeah, six four, six five. We got somebody six six outside right now. Mm. We got some big shit on the lineup too. So. We can get some shit like that going too. That'd be hard. Hell yeah. <laughs> not on no, not on no set trip and shit. We can have some right. loves versus cribs. No, we no, we viewed them in the paint. You know what I'm saying? You got a little something to work with. You know, right. so you know, got to you know. We, Tampa, it, it's all, Tampa it's got little boxing league shit already down there in the neighborhood. So right, facts. I have a vision that one day there's gonna be a live 1090 Jake slash No Jumper podcast in Boston. I'm Man. with it. All you gotta do is set it up. That I mean, would be a can, moment. Listen, I'm playing with some money. We can go in on the spot. Mm, we can facts. make it happen. That would be crazy. We can, you, we can make it happen. Bro, the crowd yeah. at that. I'm still trying to take you down to Florida. <laughs> oh, we gotta go. Let's <laughs> do that. Look, man. No, we what, pull, I'm talking. We'll man, get listen. As fuck. Mm. You come down there. It's lit. It's lit. It's lit. We'll take you to the strip clubs. All type of shit. <laughs> We're gonna link up with track. Man, we can link up with whoever the fuck you want to link up with. We gotta go link up with Kodak. I want to be there for the 1090 J Kodak I link up. I don't, I don't know him personally, and to be honest with you, he fucked with them Zoes. He a Zo. Um, I went through it with a lot of them Zoes, but mm. there's some that I do fuck with. I'm not opposed to speaking with him, talking to him, whatever. I just never have. Versus like track, nah, I can get track. We can. Mm. I fuck with track, and you know, once Melly's situation figured out. 
We're gonna get around them boys too. You're just waiting for something to happen in that case so you can make a video, huh? No, I'm just really hoping the best for them, you know? But it started Monday, and they're still doing jury selection? Like, there hasn't been any update, right? I don't think it started. I think uh -huh. people just went to saying that yeah, shit. Well, nobody, yeah, right? nobody actually checked the court site on what's going on. But, um, you know, that shit goes his way. That's going to be one of the biggest things in hip-hop. Facts. That shit going to be Ever. fucking major. Facts. Probably shit, that's going to be the next one. Yeah, and I mean, at the same time, like, bro, from Florida, bro. You know, a lot of people are rooting for him. Mm. It's scary that, to man. think that we could see a rap. We're seeing a rapper face the death penalty right now. That's I don't cool. think he'll get death. There's a lot of shit that they got to prove that I broke down in my video. Mm. Um, and when they were confronting the lead detective, a lot of the, the evidence he was trying to say was assumption. Oh, I assumed that he would benefit off of this financially because that was one of the factors right. in securing a death conviction. And, you know, it's up. We don't know how it's gonna go. We just gotta sit boy. back and watch free what melly, happens. Free melly. Definitely. Definitely free melly. It's definitely. Heard. Um. All right. Was there anything we did not touch on? Feels like we kind of touched on everything under oh, the well, sun. We've been doing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> if we missed anything, I'll fly back out. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, a good spot to eat at. People <laughs> always ask me that here, and I never really know what to say. I only see Chinese food, like Mexican food, and. No, nah, you did it. You did it. Nah, I got you, some, you, I got some really Del Taco you. last I, night. I, I, that shit. Nah, yeah. I ain't gonna even hold you. You did a um, you did you did a um, a, a podcast with the homies out of um, Nicholson Gardens and whatever. And then, you know they they took you to the one burger spot and that looked good. I'm like, dang, bro. Yeah, man, mm. that looked good. man, that looked the fire, bro. I'm like, dang, bro. That's you a know, spot. What are they over there in Nicholson Gardens? Oh, uh, bounty, bounty, bounty hunters. Bloods. Bounty hunters. Yeah, bounty yeah, them bounty hunters. Yeah. That's a lit area over yeah. there. Yeah. Oh man, it, I, it, it, looked, it looked crazy. But those burgers were stupid. Yeah. Yeah. What else is lit to do out here? Like, right? <sighs> like, that's on some certain shit. It's but weird because it's like, what do you do? You go to fucking Disneyland? Well, well fuck that's it. Though. How, saying, how like, about this? What you got going on later? Let's go do something. I don't know. Where are you guys going? We got a camp. Wherever you want to go. We got a mansion, bro, with a poker table. We, you can whatever you, you guys play do. poker? Yeah, I, man. I don't play poker like that. I, I, play I don't even know how, but I'm, he, yeah. he we got some other homies in play. I feel like when people know how to play poker, I, you usually know right away. And I, I mean, was like, know, I feel like if I, if you play poker, I would know already. I stood at the gambling table with a knife. I never did the gambling. I just made sure shit ran smooth. It all, it all depends. Like, you know, in prison, you know, we did, we, you know, they got their own kind of ways of playing sometimes. Like, you got Omaha, you know what I'm saying? You got mm. Texas, Texas Hold'em, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Straight on um, two-card stud, you know what I'm saying? So, you know. If I get locked up, I'm going to learn how to play Omaha. Oh, man, Omaha, <laughs> Omaha, Omaha, Omaha fire. Mm. I love Omaha. Nah, don't, get locked, don't get locked up, though, especially nah. out here. That should will be wild. No, nah, we got to stay out of trouble out here. That's a fact. I don't know. You we, should go we to just Rodeo. just had to teach you uh, uh, Omaha, man. Yeah. Go you, you, you gotta go to Rodeo. That's I mean, tough. Hollywood Boulevard is lit. You definitely soak up a little bit, but I mean, that's it's Rodeo's, Hollywood, you Rodeo's know. Rodeo's just shopping though, right? Rodeo's like, just shopping. Yeah, it's all designer shit. That's where everybody yeah. be getting robbed. I done did a video, a couple videos on them getting hit up for watches and shit. And they follow people home from yeah, there. See, yeah, see, I'm trying to go home with my chain. Yeah. You, know I mean? oh, you going? Come on, you going home with it? You going home with it? When you hop out the Uber and you go to the 7-Eleven, are you are you tucking the chain or no? Fuck no. No. Uh, even when we was in Inglewood, that motherfucker dancing from the time I got off the plane. <laughs> yeah, you got that bitch talking out. that shit. Why'd you go to Inglewood though? Because you know that's you know, like that's the number one LA, blood city in at. LA, right? That's where LAX is at. Right. We went to the first liquor store that we could go to, mm. and it was there. And then there was yeah. some uh, Mexican homies in the whip that had some shit to smoke and fucking. It's just a little convenient that the biggest blood that I know stops over in Inglewood. <laughs> the biggest blood city in LA that I know of, I hear. Like we didn't, we didn't yeah, run into family. nobody, but yeah. there was a yeah, lot of they, motherfucking people out there. You know what I'm saying? I was, so, I was like, "Dang, we in Inglewood for real." I'm like, "Bro, they." But we didn't, man, we didn't, crazy we didn't really know though, because we went inside of the corner store and there were nothing but blue flags and shit. So we was all oh, this yeah. must be crazy. We were making shit. jokes, yeah, yeah. Like we didn't see nothing red in there, so we were like, we might be on the wrong one. We looking at the baseball hats. They said <laughs> no, they, they had them. They, no, they, 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 they actually they, they had them. They had like two red. They had them, but they wasn't they wasn't displayed as much as the as the blue one though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, every shade of blue and then one red. You rock only Boston hats, or what else? What other hats you rock? Bulls. Okay. Shit like that. But right. I really like just having a big ass B. Yeah. I could never rock a a New York logo. Nah. Why not? <laughs> fuck no. Just because I grew up in New Hampshire and it's like, even though I don't give a fuck about sports, it's like, you know, I just feel like my mom would be deeply ashamed if she saw me with a New York logo <laughs> on me. Somebody gave me an LA hat and I wore it one time and I really didn't know how I felt about it because I do identify with LA so much at this point. But also it's like, I am not. LA guy, even yeah. if I happen to have retired away here in LA. 
It's crazy. I think the I think the New York got the best the best looking fitted cap ever. I swear. I don't right. I don't know why. I ain't from New York. You know what I'm saying? But I, I love it. I love the fitted cap. It is aesthetically yeah, pleasing. But also, if you wear a New York hat out here, everybody's gonna just be like like for me, it wouldn't be serious. It'd be like oh neighborhood neighborhood. Uh-huh. But for anybody who's actually from the streets. They probably would nah, but not you, want to rock it unless they work from there. You brought it up. If we're gonna do this East Coast no jumper, whether it's in Boston or Florida, we get that shit going. I like that idea. That should be fun. Because we got our first live show going on, but I'm already thinking like, holy shit, we could go to different cities and Man, tap and in I'm with like big ass same. people in different yeah, places. You sit me right behind no jumper news. And, hey, we doing the paperwork report. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite rapper told, and we're gonna be breaking shit down. But you never had anything that you reported on turn into real life shit for the most part, right? Like nobody ever is trying to come after you because of something you talked about in a video, right? Mm. That you know of, right? Not that I know of, but I got more smoke than what I know of. Mm. So I probably did a video on somebody dead homie and they might feel some type of way. I don't know that though. So I just gotta be militant and wherever I'm moving at, you know what I mean? You never know what's out there. Same thing with you, bro. Mm-hmm. You don't know who gonna try you one day. You just mm-hmm. gotta be ready. Very gotta ready. Correctly. We got a new store opening. Arm security from day one. So, Cannot have any fuck shit. Yeah, Mill 7 folk gonna get boomed at that spot. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> the arm security is there to make sure that doesn't happen. We're gonna be good. Um, fuck. Three hours. I ain't done a three hour one in a long time. I feel like Joe fucking Rogan. Damn, yeah. three hours been, yeah. three I, 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 Listen, I've been, I, I'm right here by the clock, so I've been I watching, you know what I'm saying? So I've been, I've been paying attention. Too, you got, <laughs> yeah. That's why I keep moving different positions. <laughs> no, but I mean, it ain't, but, but it's, a, it's a three hours that's unnoticeable because, bro, nah, you, you got, got a lot to talk about, bro, so like it, was, it. It, was, it was straight. I knew we needed an hour just for prison talk. Man, it was Never straight. mind the shit that happened in your life since then, so. Yeah. For sure. Oh. Anybody want to shout out anything that the people need to, to be thinking that, about? Man. I, I want to, can I, uh, you know, shout out CK, okay, you know man. what I'm saying? Shout out Quell, shout out Spank, shout out Wu, shout out the big sis Remy, you know what I'm saying? You know, check out Remy Rohal, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to, G, the whole GKB, whole GKB family, you know what I'm saying? Free all the bros. Love everybody, man. SL. Respect. All I know, all I show. Yeah, as far as me, everybody, he said, you know, obviously the homie Ratchet. Whoever ain't in tune, gotta get the fuck in tune. Mm. And, uh, Active. All the YouTubers, bro. All the people that's always just looking for a way to crank up something in their life. You know what I mean? Like, I literally came from nothing. I started off this shit in the hood. You feel me? Rats and roaches, this and that. And I done turned it into this, so. I love seeing YouTube change people's lives. Yeah. Like, yeah, my, my I, boy, I didn't, uh... I didn't think it could do that. <laughs> I didn't know about how much power this shit really had. Mm. My boy, 16 Shot and Visuals from Chicago. Yep. He just had a No Limit Cairo on there, talking shit about G Herbo and yeah, all that I shit. Seen that shit. And he just had his first, like, really crazy month. And it's just like, you know, it just hey, really sh- warms out, my heart out, seeing that, you know? Shout out to 16, because, you know, after Zach TV, he really mm-hmm. been the one carrying the torch for Chicago. So, you know, it's, uh, it's good to see he's getting that recognition, because I've, I've, I've seen a couple of things that he's put out. He's doing great shit. I like my boy Swayze out of the Bronx, too. He's talking about that Bronx shit. That's just crazy over there. Yeah. And he, he's just, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That shit like Iraq right now. Wild. <laughs> Free K-Flock, though. Free that yeah. man, yeah, for sure. K-Flock. <laughs> That's a wild situation. <laughs> That's a wild one, for sure. Not the Amiris. Yeah. Not Amiri the Amiris. Assassin. Not the Amiri Assassin. <laughs> <laughs> Montclair Monster. Oh, for sure. Uh, 1090 J, end of sentence. Appreciate you, man. I appreciate you, bro. Much love. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, right. Patreon, all that shit. Like, comment, and subscribe. Nojumper.com <laughs> if you want to support. Go subscribe to End of Sentence if you're not already.